Welcome everybody to our uh, council meeting today on the 10th of March and um, I will just open us with our opening karakia. Tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro, tu tawa mai i roto, tu tawa mai i wahu. Ki a tau ai te Māori tū, te Māori ora ki te katoa, hōme, huie, tāiki e. So welcome everybody, we've got a very full agenda today and um, we will crack right into it so that we're not sitting on Zoom um, for hours on end. Uh, we do not have any apologies today. Uh, are there any conflicts of interest? Excellent. So we do have um, two presentations in our public forum today. And uh, first up, I would like to welcome Sarah Wormsley and Anna Pirard from the Prima Volta Charitable Trust, uh, who will be giving us a presentation on um, some new projects that they are looking to launch. And they have been um, approached us for some funding to assist with that. So um, I'll pass across to them to share some more information with us. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, um, ko Anna Pierrard tōku ingoa. My face might be um, familiar to you. Um, I'm very pleased to be in the office with Sarah Wormsley, who's now permanently based in Hawke's Bay and is the co-founder of Project Prem Volta uh, and Festival Opera. And I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to a young um, singer who's based in Wellington at the moment and is, is central to our application. And his name is Leela LJ Crichton. Uh, so he, he will be contributing to this um, presentation. Uh, this morning, we're just really keen to connect with you and help you to understand that what we, what we prioritize in terms of what we want to deliver to the community is much more than just about singing in opera. It's about continuing to, to serve the community that we now, um, cherish and want to be a part of and ensure that everybody has access to the sorts of experiences that a healthy community can demonstrate. Um, and so I, I think what, what you may have received uh, by email is a link to, a, to a, a little demonstration of what Rangatahi and Tamariki can access through our programs. In this video, uh, I think you've got a link which will enable you to, to gain some insight. If you haven't already uh, had, a, had a wee look, you've got another opportunity today. And, um, and then you may, you may catch a glimpse of a young uh, graduate of our program, of, of LJ, who'll be in there, uh, and not just in a capacity as a singer, but, but crucially as a mentor, as a teacher, and as a facilitator for uh, helping young young kids achieve excellence so perhaps it would be a great opportunity to um to press to click play so that so that you can experience that um that demonstration together <laughs> Foundations, you're on it. <laughs> Love it. Find it. I'll be like that. You can see it. So I think we had intended to send you a slightly longer video um, of six minutes, but maybe the um, got mixed up somewhere and <laughs> uh, sending it across. And, and did she talk to you about the cocoa and the stuff? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, just explain that what we saw there was um, a short video of our recent, um, unfortunately cancelled due to COVID production, but that we made some great progress on with both our PPV um, cohort, our PPV junior cohort, and some of our most exceptional um, Kiwi opera singers who we brought in. Um, the longer video that you can probably have a look at, I think Kirsten may have sent it out to you, um, just demonstrates a little bit more of um, what we hope to create um, through the programs, which is a strong sense of tuakana tena, um, providing opportunities for young people to find their voice um, and not just find their voice um, on stage, but to build great skills um, and confidence to take them through into their, into their lives. So we wanted to just um, pass over to Leela LJ Crichton, who's on the call. Um, and he was just going to provide you a little bit more of his um, view on the opportunity for the program for which we're seeking funding, which is actually a, um, a graduate mentor program, we're calling it. So to enable our PPV graduates who have gone off to um, further their own musical careers to really come back and embed themselves into our organization and become our sustainable future of, um, of PPV. So I'll hand over to LJ. Thank you. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, I'm LJ or Lila. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that video um, showed all of the like um, surface level stuff, um, what you would expect from PPV. Uh, what you, you what you would expect from Festival Opera, um, but a lot of um, the intended video showed a lot more of what you don't see, um, which is what we um, as PPV students are kind of you know surrounded by and engulfed by and um, embraced by, which is this um, sense of service, the sense of um, giving back, the sense of um, um, nurturing. Um, our, our, our peers and um, the younger generations um, and so what I what I think is of value um, in this program is, is this is the sense that we um, can go out and seek further education where we can go out and uh, grow ourselves and focus on ourselves um, and then find that moment where it's like the perfect time to come back um, and and share um, is, is what I think is important um, um, sharing music and sharing our experiences and um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, what I what I got out of PBV um, because I was on PBV since 2013 um, at its inception, I think is the right word. <laughs> um, and what I learned through PBV is that um, first that you know um, all things are possible, <laughs> um, and then secondly um, that nothing nothing gets done without um, without service, uh, nothing, nothing is achieved without um, working with working as a community. Um, and so, I what I think is, um, is 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 valuable in this context is is, is that uh, Sarah and Anna have have um, proposed that we come back and we we help out with with this group, which is something that we've always been waiting to do, um, except. Um, it's never really been a realistic thing because um, just from our point of, from our side where it's not something that we think we're qualified enough to do. Um, but again, with Sarah and Anna, um, that's not really a problem <laughs> um, um, because to Sarah and Anna, we're the most qualified people in the world. Um, to us, we're kind of just going with it. Um, and when I, when I look back at it, I, I understand because um, we now have, you know, some of us who go going off to do some really insane things. Um, I don't know if it's in the application, but Catherine and Emmanuel are currently studio artists for New Zealand Opera. Um, myself and another member from Wairangi Henare are just are preparing to um, go on a worldwide tour, oh, worldwide, not worldwide, countrywide tour uh, with Chamber Music New Zealand. Um, and all of all of those experiences um, are like just valuable. Um, all of those experiences um, um, students can take away from young people can relate to. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, one thing that I've, I, I, I think that I want to do right now um, is get into a room with um, some people who want something and to, to, to help them achieve that, um, something like what I received from Anna and Sarah, um, but um, 
just from a familiar face. Um, I think that I think that's uh, probably what we're trying to achieve here. Um, but yeah, I, I really, <laughs> I also do wish that that, that video played. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's that's probably that's probably most of it for me, actually. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it for me, actually. Yeah, it would be great um, if we could maybe just. Um, provide that link again to the longer version of the video. It's a Vimeo link actually, um, so that might make it easier to, to see. So we wanted to just update councillors uh, and let you know that um, we have applied to Manitou Taonga for innovation funding to, to really um, substantially fund this program. And we're delighted to announce that we have received that funding or we were in the process of receiving that funding. We were successful in that application. So we have um, great confidence that we can now essentially, you know, the, the vision for Anna and I is to hand the reins of what we have developed here in, in Hawke's Bay over to the next generation of PPV um, graduates and other experts um, and mentors who can really help to provide a breadth and a richness mm. of experience to young people. Mm. And of course, with Festival Opera providing the platform to test all of the skills that have been developed through the program. So it's an incredibly important relationship we have between those two entities. Um, and maybe we'll just open it up to some questions if there is time. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah and Anna, and I will just open up um, quickly for any questions that councillors might have. Doesn't look like it. So um, thanks for coming to present to us today. Uh, as you both know, I'm a huge supporter of PVCT and PPV, um, and just it's been a pleasure to watch you grow over over the years and um, the incredible work you do with our um, rangatahi here in Hawke's Bay is, is just fantastic. So um, great to see you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. so much. Kakite. Kakite. And as I mentioned, we do have a second presentation in our public forum today. So I would now like to welcome Graham Duncan, who um, is going to talk to us. We have had presentations from Graham before with regards to the proposed Ahariri Rock Pools development. Um, so welcome, Graham. I'll pa pass across to you. Uh, morning, Mayor Kirsten, and to you all. Uh, just from the outset, what we have agreed to take on board today is to allow Stephen Dace to front the presentation, and I'm with uh, Michael Bassett Foss here in the Horse Bay Regional Council building, and uh, we'll leave it to uh, Stephen to spearhead the presentation, and we'll all fit in as required. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Duncan, um, Mayor, Mayor Kirsten and councillors, uh, Tina Koto Katoa. My name is Stephen Daish. I'm a long-term resident of Napier. We moved from Wellington, my wife and I, 25 years ago, and we've raised three, three children are all at three different universities now around the country. Um, I'm um, presenting this presentation really because um, I've watched this project over the last couple of years as a resident and as an experienced resource management practitioner. Um, I run a company called Mitchell Daish, which is now a nationwide um, specialist planning and environmental company. And really, um, everyone I talk to in my network, and I have a reasonable network around the place, is just pretty blown away by this, this concept from a from an overall health um, family opportunities perspective, and also as a tourism um, opportunity for Napier to really fill a, a niche in the market that, that I see for family tourism. Um, my mum and dad are Wellington Warrior based, and they tell me about the days when they used to come up on the rail car and the train as families and actually just come to Hawke's Bay for the whole school holidays, staying with family. And we, we need things for kids to do and also for the older generation to feel safe to participate in our wonderful environment. Um, so I'm a big fan. Um, I've been working on this pro bono 
um, pretty much just to support Duncan's, oh, sorry, Graham's vision. And I'm joined by a couple of other really dear colleagues of mine, uh, Michael Bassett Foss and John Clark, who's a very experienced coastal hazard expert. So I just want to kick off by saying that um, I've looked at all the papers and have been involved in a lot of the discussions. And Graham has really been followed a very clear pathway recommended by um, Mayor Kirsten Yu um, and also Steph and the previous interim CEO that of, of steps to go through. I'll just run through those. Um, um, the recommendation was that this needs to be a charitable trust venture, which um, is underpinned by community trustees and a, a community um, perspective. Um, that has now been established and um, trustees are appointed. Um, also, and a bank account established and, and ready to go. Um, also, we've met with the Māori Committee uh, to present our credentials and seek some input to get some iwi members on the, the trust, which we think is vital. Um, Graham's been following up with the Port of Napier um, about a partnership approach, and they are very, very interested um, in terms of an overall look at the Ahuriri environment from, um, I think it's got a new name, but uh, Perfume Point. Um, I haven't caught up with uh, the actual name through to the port in terms of an integrated sort of um, project that encompasses some of the necessary long-term sea level rise protection um, measures. Uh, I facilitated the um, Tongoyo to Clifton Coastal Hazard Strategy for the Regional Council and the two TLAs yourselves and, and Hastings, very aware that longer term, that whole area, area does need to be enhanced in terms of coastal hazard protection. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so, so we, we've been working as a, as a pretty um, cool team, um, very experienced team, pretty dilig diligently following through all the recommendations to get this project sort of moving along. But we, we're now at the stage that the last recommendation, um, one, of the, one of the other recommendations was to submit to the LTP, which we did. Um, and now we've been asked to submit to this um, fund to provide just some kick on kick off feasibility funding, which this project really does need um, and support both more, more than just tested support from the council, um, some real support in terms of a grant to let some initial feasibility um, work be done um, by our professional team. Um, there's only so long you can go with these projects to look at the details um, sort of on a, on a wing and a prayer. So we are looking at um, support from Napier City Council for uh, I think it's a $70,000 grant that um, Graham has put through through the system and has been supported by the council. And this is where we get to um, uh, present the reasons for that. Graham has presented a one page summary of all of the background. And I don't think we really need to sell the benefits and the logic and the, and the environmental and community benefits of the project anymore. That's not what we're about today. I think that's been well established. We are just asking really pretty pretty straightforward. Um, the, the project, I think, has great legs. It will be difficult, difficult con to consent of, and under no illusions there, it will need a very strong and inclusive partnership with Mana Whenua. Um, we've made some, or made an, a number of approaches, me personally, to Mana Hariri and other senior people within our Māori community here in Napier. Um, they've been very busy, as you know, with elections and those sorts of things. But part, part of the reason I think we need to get this on a proper footing with some, some support and some feasibility funding is that that good, good, good engagement uh, and meaningful engagement with Mana Whenua does need some time and some, some good processes. And I think the key part of our feasibility and business case um, work, which we've already uh, outlined in a, in a memo to the council about the work we're doing is around really looking at a vision that our mana whenua will be very supportive of. Um, I'm under no illusions that this project won't, 
won't go ahead with that that strong support. Um, so we're looking at the council here um, to provide us some, some facility to really um, roll up our sleeves and, and move us through to the next part of the journey. Um, so look, that's pretty much um, my pitch. Um, I'm, I'm sitting on a, on a chairing the New Plymouth District Plan hearings at the moment, so I've adjourned those for half an hour this morning so we can we can uh, talk to you um, and I'm uh, and uh, yeah really really short and sweet but that's that's us um, and we'll probably um, me and Kirsten just open up to any questions you may have. Uh, thank you Stephen and yes this is certainly a very um, exciting project and um, it's been great that uh, you've followed the advice provided in terms of setting up the trust um, and moving forward. Uh, I will just open up to councillors if they have any questions. Richard. <coughs> um, good morning. This, good morning. This, is a, is a, look, this is wonderful for Hawke's Bay, for our locals and for residents, but just you know, you said you're an environmental planner. This is what you do, you know, for a living. Are you saying this is very doable? Give or take, you know, excluding money and there's work to do with mana whenua. Do you believe this is very doable? Yes, I do. I was asked the same question, Richard, at the LTP hearing. Um, I think uh, this is a large project. It will need a lot of community support, but part of the feasibility study will be to test my my long experience that I think this is do doable based on my experience with complex projects. That's our business. Mitchell Day does hard, tricky, complex um, resource consent projects. That's our, our bread and butter. Um, at the end of the feasibility study, um, we'll be able to give the council confidence that this has broad community support and broad mana whenua support or not. Um, the project's too exciting just to let it um, sit without actually really thoroughly testing those issues and it needs to stack up from a business perspective. Um, if those those stars align, um, certainly it is doable. Um, it's very in line with what the community has asked for in the coastal hazard strategy. This Ahuriri community needs some more work around rock shore protection and certainly, um, yes, um, in essence, this is doable. Um, we just need to dip our toe in the water just to test that and provide the councillors and the community confidence that we're not going to proceed with this as a as something that's just going to cause cause problems going along. Um, one of the issues about mana whenua is that we now have um, the MACA, MACA um, legislation where essentially the foreshore is now owned as a property right by um, certain um, mana whenua um, interests. Um, it's been through a recent High Court case. So that is why this just will be a possible advance without their, their blessing. And with that blessing, um, definitely we're in business, I think. Thank you. It doesn't look like there's any further questions. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, to should, sorry, there's um, uh, Councillor Brown and myself have got hands up. Just apologize. I know we're working from small oh. screens, so. Yep. No. Sorry about that. Um, Api, I'll pass across to you first. Um, thank you, Your Worship, and sorry to interrupt your flow. Um, just um, sort of two questions for you, uh, if that's right. Thanks, uh, Stephen. The first is um, great to hear um, the enthusiasm we're getting from different sectors of the community. Um, because I was really concerned around whether or not this concept was long-term viable. Um, but based on your comments around your collective experience, you think that it's a worthy horse to bet on. So um, with regards to those challenges around engaging with mana whenua um, and their role around helping to provide input into any changes that happen along that shoreline, do you feel um, that their support is at least consistent with or better than other sectors of our community who you've engaged with? Or do you think there's still a bit of way to go with um, conversations with iwi, or as, as you were saying before, that mm. challenging space meant that you haven't been able to progress those conversations, 
where are we at with your engagement with iwi and do you anticipate that that will continue to follow a positive trajectory yes great great question api um i think um i've been involved with um, a lot of discussions with the wider community so people that really want to put their money where their mouth is on this project and the, the consistent message is it needs at least some support of the feasibility level from Napier City for them to sort of put their shoulder to the wheel and put their money into it. And so it's like a, a, a chicken and egg thing. But in terms of um, the mana whenua question, um, as you know, these things take time. Um, you know, I'm a big part of my practice is working with mana whenua on achieving great outcomes. That's what I love doing. Um, certainly in terms of the mana Ahariri board and um, Titai Whenua, um, local um, Whanganui Te Arotu, Tai Whenua, um, I've got some good links in there and the indications have been very respectful, um, the feedback in terms of initial discussions, keenness to talk, wanting to be at the table and not be told about it and so we've been very careful even though with, there's been quite a lot of media around this, a, a little bit of media and a bit of social media, not to get too far ahead of ourselves because I feel that the design, a bit like the airport work, really has to be come from the, the heart of the mana whenua and be integrated in there. And that's why um, some time just to, to quietly sort of take the project away, um, work quietly in that space with, with mana whenua and um, see what might be able to be generated through their, their design, um, co-design input into what might, might be. Um, so yes, cool. um, um, warm, warm response, but cautious response is how I'd, I'd counter the, uh, or how I couch that, that feedback to date from Mana Whenua. That's a, um, fantastic, Stephen. I think there's still a positive way to frame a difficult place to navigate. The last thing, question I have for you is, um, uh, you've already indicated there are a number of uh, people within our community who have given um, of kind and service around because they see a perceived value. Um, this will have an impact on ratepayers, and um, this is something we'll need to, if it eventuates, if the feasibility study shows it has great promise. Um, so this is a question to you as a ratepayer. Is this something that you would put a dollar behind, knowing we've got a lot of major infrastructure and a lot of major challenges ahead? Yeah, with, with, without a doubt, um, um, absolutely. Yeah, I'm doing this um, as much for the love of our community and opportunities for our, our makapuna and our grandchildren, um, just places to, to play that are safe, both from a, um, you know, I'm worried about kids swimming in the in the iron pot sort of area. I'm worried about kids big time along that marine foreshore. Um, they've got a tiny little beach down by the port, which is pretty pathetic really. Um, and, you know, interaction with water is just such a life force thing for, for everyone, particularly children. Um, so I, I see that a massive um, benefit and I'd certainly put my, really support the council investing in that. Thank you very much. No further questions, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Brown. Good morning. Um, just a clarification to start with. This feasibility study is um, the estimate to do that about two hundred thousand. It, it is to do it properly. Um, we're looking at seventy thousand as a as a kickstart because my observation, Councillor Brown, is that everyone's just waiting for um, yes some some support and principle from Napier City Council that this is a good idea to investigate. Um, and then that gives them the confidence um, that, you know, as, as, as community leaders, the council really has to think, well, this has got some legs, let's investigate it. And I'm pretty sure with that, with that initial support, um, you know, my contacts and our contacts generally with the regional council, for example, are pretty strong. So I'd hope to be knocking on James's door and, um, um, the council is there to say, hey, um, let's let's look at some of these board environmental benefits and associated with this hazard um, protection risk assessment we've been doing on the coast that, you know, it certainly lines up right in that zone. So I, I think just a kickstart, toe in the water. Um, um, we'll, we will be, be completing the feasibility study. If we can't get any more funding, we'll probably just complete it on the back of it being a, 
you know, our, our contribution to the community in terms of the, the the professionals that are involved in this. Okay. And, well, you've answered my question, which was um, if we couldn't, for some reason, grant you the full 70000 um, do you have other sources of funding available to get there? So. Yeah, look, I, I think $70,000 for the scale of this project um, is what we need. It's, 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 sent, it's a, to me, it, it's a sense of it being more than just, um, um, yeah, 70000 is a good chunk of money. Um, it's a sense that it's more than just, um, you know, a few a few weeks of work. I think it does need to be a bit more than, than that. So the 70000 is, I think, about appropriate to kickstart some other funding sources. Thank you. Hmm. And I'd better get back onto my um, <laughs> my hearing, Kirsten, if, if that's okay, I'll, I'll, be, I'll better leave. So um, yep. thank, thank you very much for your time. So thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you also, Michael and uh, Graham, and we'll be in touch very soon. Thank you very much. So we'll now uh, move into announcements by myself. And I do have a couple of announcements to make today. Firstly, I wanted to just take a moment uh, to congratulate Mana Ahariri with their settlement being finalized on the 3rd of March this year, following the third and final reading of the deed of settlement, recognizing the seven hapu of um, Ahariri late last year. So very much looking forward to working in partnership with Mana Ahariri uh, as we move forward. And I also just wanted to take um, some time to talk about um, the three waters. So as some of you may be aware, um, the working group that was established um, after widespread opposition to the three water reforms last year presented their recommendations to Minister Mahuta uh, earlier this week. Uh, there were 47 recommendations in total in their report and um, at, at sort of summarising those, um, the changes that they have put forward, um, main ones were around actually instituting a, a public shareholding structure, uh, which is intended to address and um, protect the community ownership issue, which has been raised and shares will be held by councils on behalf of their communities. Uh, they have recommended establishing tighter accountability for each water services entity board to the community through some new um, stronger mechanisms. They are um, looking to introduce sub-regional committees designed to ensure that local voices are considered an investment prioritisation and the establishment of a water services ombudsman. The report included recognising uh, te mana o te wai, the health and well-being of water and the wider environment as an underlying principle. And uh, it was also um, a recommendation to ensure that co-governance embracing te ao Māori to improve three water service delivery environmental protection. Um, it would be fair to say that um, as a region, collectively, uh, we're, we're very disappointed with the recommendations that have come through. We presented to the working group our Hawke's Bay model um, and were able to show the viability of our Hawke's Bay model. And unfortunately, um, that has been uh, dismissed. So I think what's been recommended by the working group only only goes some way and, and, and not very far at all to address the critical issues that we and, and the community have raised to government. And quite frankly, I think they're just a once over lightly attempt to address our very real concerns that Hawke's Bay voice will be lost from decision making along with local asset ownership. Um, the idea of sub-regional groups feeding into the so-called regional representative groups simply adds another layer of accountability between local communities and the multi-region entities. So how will that um, deliver a strong voice for the people of Hawke's Bay? So we will continue to work alongside uh, the, the other Hawke's Bay councils. We are also a member of the Communities for Local Democracy, which now consists of 31 councils around the country who um, will continue to campaign against the proposed Three Waters reforms that, that are before us. 
Um, the minister has not yet uh, provided any uh, additional information or, or her thoughts on the recommendations that have come through from the working group. Uh, so that will be the next step and we will wait to hear from her um, with regards to those changes that have been recommended. Uh, so that is my two announcements. I will just ask if there is any minor matters not on the agenda. No. And I'll pass across to the our Chief Executive for announcements by management. Uh, tēnā koe, your worship, uh, tēnā koutou elected members, um, members of staff and members of the public today. So um, there are no announcements from management other than uh, the significant stage of the Three Waters reform, which uh, the Mayor has already outlined. I will um, just add to uh, what Her Worship has said in the sense of um, reiterating that the scope that was given to the governance um, representation and accountability group was limited in our view, uh, and their 47 recommendations have reflected uh, their scope so it is disappointing that we have not been able to talk about our structure of the water service entities as part of this um, significant period. Um, thank you, Mia Wise. Thank you, Steph. And yes, that's a very good point. Um, I'm certainly not criticising the working group in any way. The terms of reference that they were working to were very limited and did not enable them to actually address some of those critical issues that have been highlighted by the community and councils. So. Uh, we'll just move now into confirmation of minutes. So the draft minutes of the ordinary meeting of council held on Tuesday, the 21st of December, 2021. Do I have a mover and seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Tupney and Councillor Crystal. All those in favour, please say aye. And against. Aye. Carried. Now, as I said earlier, we've got a pretty um, hefty agenda ahead of us today, and we will be starting off with our paper on aquatic facilities. So I would like to invite uh, Glenn Lucas to open us up, please, and present the report. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Kia ora koutou. Um, so today, to help us go through uh, the papers that we've presented, we've got a number of externals online with us. So we have Jamie Yule, who's the engineering geologist and project manager from Tonkin and Taylor. We have Ben Quain, who's the technical director, quantity surveyor and project manager from Dean and Quain. We also have Jeff Cannum, who's the principal parks and recreation specialist from Jeff Cannum Consulting, which is now called Thrive Spaces and Places. And we also have Cam Drury, who's the director and principal planner from Strategy. So all of these guys will be available to, um, to chip in and ask, answer questions when we get to that part of the agenda. So the item that's in front of us um, is an aquatic facilities item which brings together the two separate sustainable Napier reports. Um, so those two reports were the aquatic development, options for consultation, and the Napier Aquatic Centre Capital Review. So I'll provide a really brief overview of these. I'll take these as, as read, and I know they've been up and um, yeah, up for previous discussion at Sustainable Napier, and we've had a couple of workshops since, since that meeting. So the aquatic development options for consultation. W within that paper, the paper presented the contamination and geotechnical reports on Onikawa that Tonkin and Taylor have produced for us. It included a multi-site criteria analysis performed by Jeff Kinnam Consulting. It included a high-level planning assessment of the resource consent implications of the two potential sites at Onikawa. It included a Tonkin and Taylor engineering risk uh, review to inform the comparative costings, and it also included the Dean and Quain uh, cost estimates for each of the three options, considering the remedial works required for the specific risks at the Onikawa site. So I'll go through each of those items really briefly. Uh, the contamination and geotech report that was produced that gave us a far more information as to um, the, the conditions at Onikawa told us we had challenging in situ ground conditions, um, we had uncontrolled fill, we have levels of contamination which are variable across the site, we have very shallow groundwater levels, uh, there are existing infrastructure under, under the ground that will need to be um, addressed or, or remediated in some way, uh, and we have liquefaction present there, uh, but very similar to levels across most of Napier. So, so I guess the, the key piece of information that came from that, or the key new piece of information, was the geotechnical conditions that were present at Onikawa and how, how challenging there are with, with a lack of a, a solid layer to um, found anything on. 
So moving through to the site assessment that uh, Jeff Cannon Consulting performed for us, the, the intention of this piece of work was to go to an external person and to take all of the, um, you know, the emotion and the, um, the, the journey to date out of it and say to someone suitably challenged, we've got these three potential options. Um, can you do an assessment and tell me what you think? Um, they used our aquatic strategic framework that was signed off by council as, um, as uh, to inform a whole bunch of the criteria. And they also used a lot of Napier City Council strategic documents and, and really was trying to produce a view of a 50 year asset. So try to keep it very strategic in, in their assessment. Uh, the assessment that Jeff Cannon Consulting produced um, ranked Prevenson at 77 and the two options at Oni Kawa at 63. Uh, the, the planning assessment that strategy was engaged to do for us was, was really a, a high level planning assessment of the two potential options at Oni Kawa. So we had one option that was on the tennis courts to the north eastern side of the site. Uh, that was what council um, indicated that they would like to pursue. Um, we had also had a look at option three, which is a little bit more central on the site to really try to manage those potential risks of, um, of getting resource consent, given that option one is quite close to the um, close proximity to the residences on Gallipoli Road. Um, so the strategy report told us that option three would progress through the plan planning process with less resistance, but to not discard option one as the challenges there may, may well be overcome. And strategy also provided us with some recommendations to work through to produce a preferred option there. So moving on to the Tonkin and Taylor engineering risk review, which really was um, helping us with the implementations of the known site conditions. Um, so the upshot of, of that review was that in terms of a, a program time or time to completion of a project, time to when we're opening the door on a, on a brand new facility, um, Prevenson Drive was 38.5 months and both the Onikawa options are 66 months to completion. And the work that Dean and Quain have done taking those engineering risk reviews and transferring it into, into dollar terms provided comparative costs for Prevenson Drive in today's, today's dollars and assuming that we open it um, you know, within those, within those program times. So that was within about five years or so. For $71 million or $71.5 million compared to Onikawa option one and option two that are at 108, around about $108 million. So we're talking about a $37 million differential for um, the, the same facility on two different sites. So moving through to the capital review program. Um, this, this is some work that's been undertaken by, by officers, um, really asking the question of what is required to extend the life of this facility for, for 10 plus years. So at that stage, and, and still currently, there is no budget in the long-term plan for a new aquatic development. So that was the, uh, the time frame that, was, that needed to be applied. There has been a period of, of managing the asset of deferring maintenance and renewals improvements um, as you know, a, a new facility was on the horizon. So now that's been, now that it had been pushed out, we needed to have a look at, okay, how do we make this current facility um, last for how long we need it? So we did run a workshop with council, I think in October last year, and the indications from council then was to prioritize the recommendations that we've produced into three categories. Uh, the top priority was health and safety and legislative compliance. Um, the second category was service continuity or what things are required to make sure that this asset continues to operate at, at some level. And the third category were the level of service improvements, the things that can, um, you know, make the place, um, is the best way to word it, um, look a bit nicer and, and present a bit nicer, really. So the paper recommended an investment of 8.6 million across two years to address the health and safety and business continuity uh, categories only. Um, these two, and I think that's the reason why these two papers have been brought together into one item, is that they really are really tightly interlinked. So really the quicker we get to a new facility and the quicker we're opening the doors on a new facility, the less remaining life is left in the existing facility. Therefore, um, that will enable officers to look at the required investment with a slightly different lens. It's a very different lens from saying, what do we need to operate for 10 years? compared to um, you know, five years or seven years or, or whatever, the, um, whatever the desired term will be before we get to a, um, if we get to a new facility. So since the meeting on September 17, uh, sorry, on <laughs> February 17, 
Uh, we have had two workshops with councillors to address questions that have posed. Um, there was a document circulated last night, and apologies for the, for the lateness of that, which is really intended to bring together a lot of those questions from councillors um, and to provide the basis for a question and answer document that, um, that, will, that will be going to public. Uh, and since the September 7, why am I stuck on September? The February 17 meeting, there's a couple of areas of further information to note. So um, we have caught up with our internal roading teams to look, work through the roading implications of Onikawa. So in the original costings, we put a provisional sum of around about 1.5 million to make any roading adjustments that are required to make Onikawa and the surrounding roads fit for the amount of visitors that are predicted to handle, um, mm. that, to be attracted by the new facility. Um, they produced three potential options to have a look at um, enable surrounding roads, and I won't go into those to any great detail, but they also advise that um, the provisional sum is revised from 1.5 million to 3.5 million. So those costs have been um, reflected in the, the overriding paper to go across both of these. And we're also asked by councillors to have a look at the impact of sunk costs, because we are a little bit further on the journey with the Prevence and Tamatia Drive before the project was paused. Um, there are some sunk costs in there, which mean that the um, cost to completion are different from the total project costs that were in that um, the original paper. So we are looking at um, design costs, uh, resource consent, the technical reports that have been done, and also the site preparation work that's been done with the preloading and the stormwater detention ponds. So the upshot of the sunk costs is that the total for Prevence and Tamatia Drive comes down from an estimated 71.5 down to um, 70.3. And for the sake of consistency and the fact that we're assuming that the same design is going to be used for both Onikawa options one and two, um, we have also subtracted the design costs from those options as well. So that brings us down to a little bit more like 109 million. Um, and that bearing in mind that that's also including those additional roading amendments. So um, an important piece of work that was directed by council during the last meeting was for officers to prepare a phased plan of the proposed detailed expenditure to bring back to council for endorsement. So this was for the, um, the remediation investment required for the existing facility. Um, I may hand over quickly to Drew Brown, who's the project manager who's been working very closely with me on this to just provide a, um, a really brief overview of, of that piece of work. Drew, are you there? I am here. Can people hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. Um, I'll remain without the video at the moment because I'm in the office and we don't actually, I found that when I have the video on, it tends to, to drop out. Um, I, I will just come up now. Fantastic. Okay. So in a very limited amount of time, we have reviewed the uh, scope of work. Um, we prioritised the scope of work um, and put it into discrete packages. Um, we just applied our best practice project management methodologies and uh, principles. And basically what has happened is we, we front loaded that uh, scope somewhat. We spread it across two years. And um, the reasoning for that is um, we've been able to put it into small discrete packages of work, which will then be more attractive for engagement of contractors. Um, we have tried to organize them so that the independent, the dependencies and interlinking um, works the best possible. And uh, we're able to minimize the disruptions to service as much as possible. There's a few key assumptions that we've put into what we've done. And those assumptions basically are um, an ability to start on the 1st of April this year with procurement. Um, and that puts us on the work face uh, beginning of the, the coming financial year. Um, other assumptions are access to quality contractors, um, the work face and a tolerance on interruption to levels of service as they stand at the moment. I have in front of me, and if I can, I will try and share the screen. You. Glenn, can you um, pull up that 
that attachment that I had, please, mate. The um the one on the Gantt, please. I've got it if you need, Glenn. Try again. That one. Shit. Can you see this um screen now? I did eyes. Can anybody see the Gantt shot that come up? Excellent. So this this is all rolled up as, as much as possible. Um, what you'll see here is a procurement period followed by a construction period. Um, I've rolled up as best as possible, showing uh, building works, civil works, consultant services, um, MEP work and specialized works, uh, the description of those. Um, you'll see basically a, a very short period of procurement um, followed by a long period of or a period of, of construction practical works. And as you'll see in there, it is all as front loaded as possible. I'm quick going on, I'll go on to a screen here. And this thing will quickly show a summary of summary. Um, share. And cash summary. Um, that should now appear as a Excel spreadsheet um, with a small table on the left hand side. What that small table left hand side, hopefully, if you can all see it, showing, is that the 22 23 year is showing us with a, um, a required expenditure of around six and a half million, with the 23 24 showing um, a balance of 1.9. Uh, you notice that there's nothing through February to the June period um, that is likely to be required later on as there's a very high chance that we will be dealing with any um, discoveries that come up through the work. Um, and it's based on the, the brief summary of where we're at with, with the program and the, uh, the cash flow. Back to you, Glenn. Um, okay, thanks, Drew. So that's that's pretty much an overview of the two papers and uh, the work that's been done between between the last meeting. And, and it's really just time for um, questions from council. Oh, sorry, um, Steph has got her hand up because she was going to add something. So far away, Steph. Um, uh, kia ora and through the chair. Um, thanks, Glenn, and thanks, Drew. So. Um, hopefully we have been able to show that well councillors directed us to prepare a schedule of works uh, based on uh, the expenditure required at Onikawa. I've also had the opportunity to review that in detail. And while I would like to say that um, there are still some significant assumptions in that uh, and the recommendation from a process management point of view is to bring the expenditure uh, forward into the first year for all of those efficiencies which Drew talked about. What I would like to propose to Council today is that we still keep the $4 million, $4 million split um, as has been proposed, which will allow me to really ensure uh, that that money is spent only as is needed. And what I mean by that is there is still a great degree of uncertainty uh, as to what is actually needed to be required. So it is prudent uh, to put the money aside. We have highlighted that these works need to be done, but I would be comfortable uh, to be uh, provided with the flexibility um, without having to preload all of that expenditure. Noting, of course, that we may lose some efficiencies in terms of project management, tendering ability, but we also may gain some efficiencies uh, in the spirit that maybe not all of that work needs to be done to the level that we have uh, defined already. So um, with that, uh, I will uh, pass back to you, please, um, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Steph, and thank you, Glenn and Drew, for that presentation. Um, so we, just a reminder to councillors, we do have Tonkin Taylor, GCC and Strategy Planning Online um, for questions, if you have specific questions for them. Um, I've just got one quick question, then I see, yep, we've got some hands going up. So. 
Um, and it, um, this may be for Tonkin Taylor or Glenn, you may be able to answer it. Um, you commented on the additional geotech um, information that we had in uh, for Onikawa and the geotechnical conditions and that um, they, my language, that um, they weren't ideal. Um, could we also just have some information regarding the Prevenson geotechnical condition? My recollection is that it was quite similar to the Onikawa. So if someone could just provide some um, information about that, please. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I might throw that to Drew and potentially Jamie as well to, to weigh on that. But um, Drew, do you want to handle that one? Yes, certainly. Um, it's handy having Jamie here because uh, Jamie was also involved to some extent at, with the original geotechs at, at Prevenson. Um, Prevenson, the issue that we have similar to Onikawa there is that below ground, it's a very long way till you get to any kind of resistant layers. Um, and so it's, it's equal to Onikawa in the difficulties found if we're going to be trying to pile anything. And that's, that's really part of the reason why we went with a preload there rather than any other form of, of setup. Uh, we also had the luxury of time, uh, the fact that it was green field um, and the amount of uncontrolled fill there was very limited. So basically at Prevenson, what we did was we scraped the surface and stuck a whole pile of fill on it, um, engineered to be a preload. Um, subsurface at, beneath that preload is very similar to what's encountered at Onikawa below the landfill layer. Uh, would you concur with that, Jamie? Yeah, look, I think that's a fair assumption. Um, Drew, it's, it is fair to say that Onikawa, from a geotechnical perspective, is more challenging with the fact that it's a brownfield site. There's uncontrolled landfilling across the site. Um, and, and as you say, with with Prevence and Drive, the, really the only um, con constraint we had was to ensure that we set back sufficiently from any water bodies for any lateral spread risk. So um, Prevence and was relatively straightforward um, uh, geotechnically. Thank you for that. And I will now pass across to Councillor Taylor and then Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Actually, my question um, follows on that line of thinking anyway. Um, could one, I'm not sure which one is probably appropriate, Glenn, you might be able to, but there's been discussion about should, if we, if the pool is not, or a new pool is not located at Onikawa, then we have a site. What, um, what is best practice for development on a um, known landfill? Is it, uh, can it potentially be used for residential, commercial, or um, park? Is what, what would be the normal practice um, where you have a landfill and you want to develop that? Okay, uh, thank you, Graham. And through the mayor, it's well beyond my area of expertise, so I might have to throw to Drew again to, um, to have a crack at that one. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Um, once again, it'd be uh, quite handy to get some assistance here from Jamie. Um, we did previously go through a little bit of master planning and, and brainstorming and had a little sort of subcommittee going. Um, trying to work out what could be done at Onikawa once the area was left. One of the areas that we do, one of the things that we did take into account was the fact there are areas that we know of within the park where the capping is quite thin. And so I would advise that um, when we do, if we get the chance, go through and add some more capping to it if necessary to make sure that all the contaminated uh, soil is, is well, well catered for and below the surface. We have developments on um, Onikawa which occurred recently in the form of Omni Gym and Plunkett. So we know that if we're going to go to something which has a very shallow um, foundation and requires minimal excavation, that it is possible to manage what is there 
and to build upon it. Um, we don't have that luxury with the idea of going with an aquatic center, which requires much deeper uh, substructure. Um, I wouldn't like to take the, uh, the responsibility for saying that it's okay to build residences on that, on that location. Um, however, if we go with the likes of the experts of Tonkin and Taylor and Paddle Dalimore, we may get a better view on that. Um, I'll ask now if, if Jamie could give us some commentary on that. Please, Jamie. Yeah, thank, thank you, Drew. Um, look, regard, regardless of whether you're building commercial sites or residential sites, um, it, it's still fraught with difficulty trying to develop on the site, both from a contamination perspective and geotechnically, the, the levels of contamination in, in areas do exceed the residential um, thresholds. Um, so there is that to grapple with and, and potentially needing to remediate portions of the site. Um, you can imagine uh, wanting to build uh, your house foundations on an existing landfill is, is again uh, fraught with difficulty and probably a requirement for specifically designed structures. So whilst not impossible, it, it, um, it would still be challenging to develop the site for a commercial residential use. Um, in terms of uh, reserve land, um, there are a number of former landfill sites across New Zealand that are now uh, public open space and reserve. Um, that's quite common and, and again, maybe a, a feasible option uh, longer term for Anikawa. Um, thank you very much for that comprehensive answer. Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a question for me, I suppose, with the experts. I suppose at, at the committee conversations, um, we had kind of a line of questioning, that kind of quasi-expert questioning um, into the report. So I just wondered, seeing as we've introduced who the experts are, um, who have prepared the reports here, if I could ask a question to each of them and that is, what is your process to ensure that there is independence and avoid predetermination when you're undertaking your projects? And secondly, is there any industry standards you prescribe to that would preclude you from having a predetermined position or from misrepresenting the severity or correctness of the facts that you're presenting to us in the reports that we have? Okay, thanks, Annette. Um... Oh, Jamie, we wanted to go first on that oh, one. Oh, I'm happy to start there. No, uh, great question. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, look, um, we have quite a vigorous internal QA um, process, particularly for contaminated sites that involves sort of independent review within the business. Um, I've actually also asked um, one of our senior uh, project delivery specialists to review our risk assessment as sort of an independent gauge on um, on that risk uh, process. Um, that person's very experienced um, project manager on major infrastructure works. Um, in terms of industry best practice, we uh, follow the New Zealand environmental standards for contaminated soils. Um, that is a fairly uh, well-defined process in terms of sampling requirements, uh, reporting requirements. Um, so that framework has been followed in preparing the background technical documents. Um, in terms of the geotechnical work, um, the process there is, is generally sort of industry best practice uh, using uh, standard industry um, guidelines and risk assessments. Uh, so to answer the question, we, we've had a very um, vigorous internal review with um, uh, sort of independent people within the TNT business. Um, that being said, we always welcome any um, external um, uh, commentary. Uh, and, and look, yeah, there, there hasn't been any um, predetermined sort of views on the, the sites. Um, as Drew said, I was involved briefly uh, with Prevenson, but have largely come in quite fresh to the uh, to the Onikawa site with uh, little baggage from the previous development. Hope that answers your question. Thanks. 
Thank you, Jamie. And Mayor Wise, did you say we had representatives here from the other two reports that are being presented today? I wonder if I could ask that same question to them as well, especially around that, that ethics question. Um, thanks, Annette. Is Cam, Cam, are you able to um, have a go at that, mate? Yeah, I can go next. Um, so from our perspective, we um, are members of the New Zealand Planning Institute. Um, that institute has a code of ethics, um, which we are obliged to follow as members. Um, part of that is that we also commit to continuous professional development. Um, so I guess we, we, we have, a, um, have a professional body in that regard. Um, a lot of our work also subscribes to the principles of the Environment Court Practice Note for um, presenting expert evidence as planners. Um, so between those two codes, we, that, that's effectively what sort of guides us. Um, internally, um, we have all of our work peer reviewed as well. Um, and for this sort of work, um, that peer review is undertaken um, by either a senior planner or another principal. Um, so hopefully that answers your questions in, in terms of our approach to that matter. Thank you, Ken. Okay, um, Jeff, are you are you here? Are you able to have a crack at that one too, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, yes, from our point of view, uh, there was three industry experts uh, involved um, in our assessment, um, all of which are industry accredited. So the New Zealand Recreation Association runs an accreditation uh, platform. Um, I'm actually the chair of the accreditation body. Um, so all the team members had that level of industry accreditation. Um, that lets us uh, perform things such as technical evidence um, appear to support judicial reviews for the High Court, Environment Court, um, and so forth. Um, in terms of the standard of that, uh, that's been uh, an industry accreditation that's been running for some time. Um, I'm also internationally accredited uh, for this type of work uh, through the World Urban Parks um, Association. In terms of uh, ethics, that's powered by that platform. So that membership and that accreditation, which has to be uh, retained at a level, um, goes hand in hand with that. In terms of uh, independence, which I think came up, came up in the question, um, the panel that brought the report together uh, exceeded the usual situation where you have a singular consultant giving, a, giving an opinion. So that cross-teaming approach and the methodology outlined in the report, in effect, uh, dealt with a few things at once in terms of bias, in terms of an open book approach, um, and in terms of two separate peer reviews uh, prior to submission, and then a final um, final version of the report following that being submitted to the City Council. Um, I think in terms of the other question that came around standards, um, again the report outlines this, but our report followed a methodology which used Sport New Zealand's guidelines um, uh, for the Community Sport and Recreation Facility Development Guide, which is nationally recognised and used, and then our report outlines the detail of that. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. Oh, sorry, Annette. Mayor Wise, just very, very quickly, um, just confirming, do all of, or well, just an opportunity, I suppose, for all of those um, experts to confirm that they stand by their substantive conclusions in the reports, and perhaps we could take silence as agreement. Right, silence is golden. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and I'll now move to Councillor Price. Member the Mayor. Hey, um, I was just wondering if someone could run me through the um, the transport route changes proposed for Flanders Road entry, uh, where they came from and who prepared them, please. Okay, thank you, Keith. Um, Drew, I'm going to have to call on you again, mate, to, to answer that one. Are you able to have a, um, have a go at that? Yes, certainly. Um, 
we reviewed the ABLE um, traffic assessment that was done for the Prevenson um, site. What that gave us was that gave us vehicle numbers, um, expected times of travel, um, and gave us a, a good profile of the expected traffic loading that would be required. Um, that was reviewed um, by our internal uh, traffic engineers, um, Robin Malley's team with um, Tony Mills and Dave Kirsten assisting. They did um, engineering analysis of the junction at uh, Mardi and Flanders. They did an engineering analysis of the driveway entrance uh, that exists going to the aquatic center off of Mardi Road. And they had a look at the idea of punching through on the two properties to give a direct access between Flanders and Taradale. Um, those three assessments were driven by their understanding based on the ABLE report of the uh, traffic requirements. And those were the three options that, that they've presented that we've uh, put into that report. Uh, the costing, the ballpark costing um, of the three to three and a half um, was on their advice as well, based on their, um, their experience of, of works carried out in Napier. Just a further question, the, would it be um, quite uh, disruptive to the area on what, what changes are required? Difficult one for you, I take it. You haven't got a plan, have you? Um, there was a plan that was in the q and I, I don't know if uh, that has been made available to you. Uh, Glenn, do you know if that has gone out? Uh, yes, it has, yeah. And it was in one of the earlier workshops as well. So councillors will have seen um, the the map. It's just a high-level map. If you let me share my screen. Just, just to talk through what we were discussing, um, option one is um, roundabouts. And that was a roundabout at the junction of Flanders and Riverbend, which um, presented very little issue and very little challenge. Um, the option also had a roundabout at the junction of Mardi and Flanders. Um, due to the size of the roundabout required and the offsets required there, um, one of the big challenges was a need to widen the road. Um, and that would have encountered uh, a need to acquire some of the property um, on that junction. That was one that they, the engineers um, weren't too keen on, um, basically due to the idea of having a roundabout so close to two sets of traffic lights coming in off uh, Taradale and onto Mardi. Option two, which is um, the alterations to the existing entry exit um, that would have required a relocation or loss of the public blues there, um, a change to the pedestrian crossing there, and a flow on change to the entire parking um, arrangement that we have outside the shops. Um, option three, which was there favoured from a traffic engineer's perspective, was the provision of a new link between Taradale and Flanders. Um, that, of course, would have to get some sort of approvals from NZTA due to the, um, the, the type of road that Taradale is. And um, that's the, the three options. What that would basically mean would be the purchase of two properties back to back and uh, the demolition and the punching through of a, a roadway through where those properties used to be. Thank you. Um, I have Richard with his hand up, uh, Councillor McGraw, so we'll take a question from that and then I've had a request um, for a break. So Councillor McGraw, fire away. Yes, I, I just want to go back a bit to the term used um, earlier, lateral spread risk. Um, it's, I, I heard that term used a, a few years ago after the Christchurch earthquake and uh, had a talk from a, a, a Tonkin and Taylor engineer at the time at the aquarium. And he stated that lateral risk can be a risk for up to 100 metres away from a waterway. Um, would, the, would the proposed proposed, proposed Prevenson pool be in that zone? Or is it just be, or it's just the best place we can put it, uh, the furthest away we can put it, but it would still be in the danger zone for lateral spread? 
Um, thank you, Richard. And and through the mayor, I might throw that one again to Drew and and Jamie, who were involved in the development and the positioning assessment of the site. Yes, thank you. Um, we identified from the geotechnical surveys that were carried out by Tonkin and Taylor originally on the Prevenson site that basically we had a prescribed um, anticipated zone for high risk of lateral spread, which we turned as a zone one. And then all of our uh, design considerations was uh, demarked as a, as a red zone. Uh, further to that, we had a potential lateral spread zone, which was zone two, which was marked as a, an amber zone. And the, um, the the rest of the the area on Prevenson, which was uh, with little risk of lateral spread, uh, we we deemed it zone three as green. The uh, full design and the footprint for the building that we have at um, Prevenson has everything in zone three, um, uh, therefore avoiding what was identified as the highest risk of lateral spread and the the median risk of of lateral spread. Uh, I'll hand over to you, Jamie, and, and get your commentary on that as well, please. Thank you, Drew. Um, no, that's correct. The site, now that was assessed during the uh, consenting phase at uh, Prevenson, and, and accordingly the site was set back closer to Tamatea Drive to mitigate that risk. So none of none of the pools within that, that risk area? That's, that's correct. The site is set back within the low risk area away from the open drain. Thank you. Um, sorry, just to, just to finish that off, I've been frantically trying to find the document that um, shows the shows the zones, and I believe this one is it. Um, Drew, if you would confirm. So the red zone is the closest to the saltwater creek there with the highest risk of lateral spread. The orange zone is a you know medium risk of, of lateral spread, and the green zone is, is away from it. And as you can see from there, the entire facility is in the green zone. Yes, that's correct. Right, thank you for that. So as I said, we will take a just a five minute break um, and then come back and we'll open up after that with Councillor Crown who has her hand up.
welcome back everybody. We'll continue now with the aquatic facility paper and we're still in question time and uh, Councillor Crown, over to you. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor. Um, my question is um, around the financial prudence really um, in regards to the size of the loan that we'd be looking to take out in order to um, to build a new pool. And we were presented with a timeline around the shortest um, timeframes or the fast track process. Um, and that showed us that the quickest time that we could possibly have a new pool would be uh, 2029. Um, and I just, I was wondering if we could have some comment um, around how that loan um, value would interface with our debt cap and the fact that we're running an unbalanced budget for most of the current 10 year plan. You, uh, Your Worship, I'll just check if um, our Director of Corporate Services is online. Um, and thank you, Steve, and through the Mayor. Um, so a very good question, Sally. Um, so the, um, the long-term plan does um, identify what our cap in terms of loans are. Um, we did um, obviously we were prudent when going through our long-term plan assumptions um, and making sure that we did provide ourselves with some capacity um, for things that may come through in a long-term plan, knowing that we were also looking at a potential pool potentially at some point. Um, so we do have capacity within our existing caps to accommodate a loan for a new pool. Um, what we do know though is that the existing long-term plan um, had assumptions on rate caps with the work that was involved with the, the existing plan. So this would require us, if we were to go through this process, to undertake a long-term plan amendment and then potentially to review those caps um, because the loans associated with a new pool would be obviously in addition to what was provided for in our existing um, profile. We could address um, you know, ins and outs to accommodate um, these new requirements, and, but that would be assessed as part of the overall long-term plan amendment. Um, and Council have been provided with some details around depending on which site options they go for is depending on what those rates requirements would be. But we're looking you know, with a minimum across many years, but a total of about 5% for rate payers under existing rate payer base um, for a new loan requirement for a pool. I hope that answers your question, Sally. Thank you. Right, and next up we have a question from Councillor Crystal. Um, through the Mayor, I just um, have a question as to the rationale behind not giving a weighting to um, schools and lower socioeconomic areas as to into the site um, assessments. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Councillor Crystal. Um, Jeff, are you still online? Are you able to address how the schools were included in the uh, site assessment that GCC did for us? Kia ora. Yes, so schools were factored in. Um, we used uh, the Ministry of Education website, and uh, I think as we discussed in the meeting last week, um, what the website also reveals when you start getting there is, is the distances between um, and around two sites. So we factored it in the assessment. Uh, inclusive of uh, all, all the schools in the nearby area, distances and so forth. And that is also shown in the report's table of scoring. Thank you. Councillor Krista, was that the end of your questions? Um, Thank you. I kind of didn't answer the question because I asked about um, waiting, you know, those particular, um, uh, is quite important to our community, I would think. Oh, well, with respect to waiting, I think um, <laughs> the, what we've done in the report is also um, take elected members through uh, how those scores were arrived at. So, Leaping to an end point, one school wouldn't be weighted more than another. Um, and what we talked about last week was if you were to do that, you'd have some pretty big bias creeping into uh, location preferences 
as opposed to location needs. Um, everybody wants the pool next to them, um, that kind of thing. Um, but I think what we've done using the ministry information is show that um, on the whole, uh, when you consider people who will use the pool, with two sites only 2.7 kilometres apart, and all the things that um, the councillors have before them, there's not a but not the sort of huge degree of separation between the two sites assessment that normally makes it easy. Um, to your point though about waiting, uh, deliberately not weighted in that way. So that if you were to say, we think uh, this school should be weighted more than another, you're introducing a range of, of weightings that would be way beyond the sort of uh, industry report. And it really comes down into the realm of public consultation as to how elected members would like to make decisions around uh, what people say. Uh, and now moving to Councillor McGrath. Yeah, just through the chair, I've just had a quick look at the, um, at the roading options uh, for Onikawa. And the three options that are there, I can't see where it's considered two entrances being or, en or entry exits being used at the site, both retaining the uh, Marty Road exit and uh, reopening the Flanders exit. Is there a reason we haven't got the, the two working together? Uh, thank you, Councillor McGrath. Um, Drew, are you able to address that one again, mate? Yes, certainly. Um, we did have a look at that with the uh, the engineers. Um, the design that we had for Primston had an entry and an exit point both on the same street. Um, so one of the options there was having the entrance and the exit off of um, Flanders and two two separate uh, and separating them. Uh, a second option was looked at on the idea of either having one on Flanders and the other on two onto Māori uh, and splitting the two. Um, the, weight of tra the weight of traffic still going through uh, is, is heavier than anything we're experiencing in those locations at the moment and so roading changes would still be required. Um, the other additional that you would have there is be required to be uh, taking roading and um, going through areas that we always have difficulty with around the likes of Omni Gym, around the netball courts, around Plunkett. So we're, we're actually driven to channels, if you like, where we can put in a driveway. And those channels and driveways would be going across areas that we know to have higher levels of contamination. And so we, we actually sort of looked at the idea and said that the higher level of contamination, the higher disruption to the contaminated ground, plus the issue of now creating um, entries and exits on both Flanders and um, Onikawa didn't actually equate to any cost saving versus what we've presented there of an entry exit at the locations with, that we've shown on that drawing. It was, dis it was discredited from, from our, uh, our assessment. So it was discredited due to, due to cost and contamination rather than the actually moving vehicles around. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not following your, your question there. If, if, if you're saying that it was a, a question of moving the vehicles around within the park confines, then yes, that, that, was, that was considered because of the idea of having to create the gravel rafts for a larger car park, create the uh, the roadways required through the park uh, across contaminated areas and going around existing facilities. Um, yeah, but if, if, if we're going, if, if if we're you're going talking to, about the... Sorry, if we're going to double the number of vehicles going there, we're going to have to extend the car parks anyway. But what I was talking mainly correct, was about are. the entry and exit ways. Why we've gone down to one instead of using two. Um, that's not what I said. What, what, I, what I was saying was that if we have the entries and exits on Flanders, 
in the same way as we have the design, uh, the concept design for Privinson, then we have one entrance going into the top of the car park and an exit coming out of the bottom of the car park, but they both pour out onto the same street or come off of the same street. Um, if from what I'm understanding for, from your question that we have an entry, for example, coming off of Flanders and an exit going onto Mardi, um, so one will be a, a new entrance and the other one will be an exit onto the existing. Both, both uh, entry and exits, as they currently are, actually. Just tidied up. I don't believe that the um, entry for coming off of Flanders, the existing entry of Flanders, is used to any major extent for visitors to the Ivan Wilson complex. More to the, uh, the Learner Pool, perhaps, but not to the Ivan Wilson complex. That's, yeah, okay. um, that can be looked at, though. Thank you. Any further questions from you, Councillor McGrath? No, I'm good. Okay, so I'll move on to Councillor uh, Tapney, please. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So just some supplementary questions um, following on from Councillor McGrath. Uh, Glenn, you can determine who might be best situated to answer these questions. So the first one was when we were talking about that lateral liquefaction risk with, in regards to the Prevenson Drive. Um, Drew, you pulled up uh, one of the images from, aerial images from the Prevenson site. Um, my question to our geotechnical experts is, my understanding is those two waterways which run around the Prevenson site are engineered waterways as opposed to natural, uh, naturally occurring waterways. So does the liquefaction assessment still apply to an engineered waterway and um, equally to um, in comparison to a natural waterway or is there a difference in the way that's assessed and by extension given that this is an old harbour and that the rivers are um, feeding into the harbour used to move over time. Um, um, now we'll go with that first question around um, does engineering versus natural water waste impact on the liquefaction assessment and by extension the second question which I'll chuck out is um, with regards to actually either site um, we have spoken about uh, the foundations of either at Onikawa or at Prevenson. Um, and forgive me if this is in the report, I couldn't find it. Um, but with regards to if we go with piles, what are the associated risks, if any, with the aquifers or unconfined aquifers underneath Napier and its, and its history, given that it used to be a harbour? Okay, thanks, Councillor Tapani. Um, so the first question, just to feed it back to you to make sure we've got the, we're on the right track. Um, with the two waterways around the Prevenson site, you're wondering whether engineered waterways rather than natural waterways has a difference on the lateral spread assessment. Is that that's apply? that's correct? Yep. Okay. I think Jamie, you might be the best person to address that one, though. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Councillor. Um, in short, no, it doesn't make a difference whether it's engineered or natural. The assessment looks at the presence of what we call an open free face for material to effectively flow into the creek. Um, if you think of Avonside and, and places like that in East Christchurch where they suffered greatly. Uh, so no, whether it's natural or engineered doesn't really make a difference in the assessment. Um, the second question around uh, groundwater, um, at, look at this stage, the intention and the recommendation for both sites has been to um, avoid piling as a foundation option and to, to go with a, a shallow foundation on, on a raft or, or a ground improved block. Um, the risks are not so much around groundwater issues, it, it's more to the fact that noise and vibration from piling would be significant um, and we just don't have the confidence in a founding layer. Um, also noting the price of steel is currently subject to significant fluctuation. Um, however, with, with regards to groundwater effects, um, at Onikau we have noted the presence of a very shallow groundwater table. If there is a requirement to dewater portion of the site to construct the facility, then that would be need that would need to be assessed as part of a resource consent process. 
um, and, and groundwater effects would need to be uh, looked at as part of that. Thank you, supplementary, Your Worship. So thank you very much, guys. That, that absolutely clarifies my question. With regards to your um, introduction and information around the low water table on the Unikawa site, uh, have the costs, should that become a factor, been included in the $30 million differential between Prevenson and Unikawa? Sorry, Prevenson and the yeah, Unikawa site? At this stage, the assumption we've made is that we would build the site up out of the groundwater table to um, to mitigate the associated costs with dewatering. However, if there was a requirement to lower the floor level of the building, then obviously that would introduce cost and risk associated with any dewatering effects. Fantastic. No further questions from me, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tuckney. Uh, Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, one of the things that you see in the reports that's been explored and then discounted uh, by the experts is a, is a redesign at this stage. So I was just wondering if our, if our team could talk me through if Council wanted to explore a significant redesign at this stage of the process, i.e. if we were to kind of abandon that brief from the aquatic strategy, what would that process look like? And do we have um, our, our feelers on the costs and timeframes involved in doing that? And I suppose at the end, if you could touch on whether or not um, we would expect that to delay you know, the proposed LTP amendment as part of the annual plan decision-making. Um, thanks, Annette, and through the Mayor, I'll have a first little crack at that, and I'm sure, Drew, maybe you might have a few things to add to this as well. But um, to me, the, the preferred design that we've come up with has been the result of, um, you know, 10 plus years of work and strategies and a whole bunch of external experts contributing to this design. It's been informed at, at every stage through the needs of our community, through consultation. So what, what we have now in terms of the preferred design, whether it's at Onikawa or whether it's at Premonson, um, I have confidence that it um, will meet the, the current and future needs of Napier's community. If we are looking at a redesign, um, the question for me becomes, okay, how far back do we need to go into the process to define new needs? And if the redesign is um, geared around reducing cost, which I completely understand because these are big numbers that we're throwing around, then um, how does that compromise what's in the facility and how do we determine which bits we, we lop off basically in a, in, a, in a crude sort of a way? So um, to me, yes, it will have implications on Time frames and purely just giving a um, you know engaging a designer to do a, a, a redesign. Um, we have developed our functional requirements to a certain point, so we probably need to go back and have a look at those functional requirements and, and amend those in some way to give to um, a designer to come up with the redesign. So, um, Drew, what would, what would you add to that, mate? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, my, my it takes, it takes a while. So sometimes you find your screen jumping around. No. Um, the level of detail that we have in our designs at the moment is, is to the point where we can tell you the texture of the floor, the colors of the wall, the type of lighting, and the position of the light switches. That's, that's where we've got to at the moment. Um, and that is unusual for a design and build type package. Um, for us to get back to that same that same level um, with a, a different design um, would take us about a year. Um, we would need to go through uh, an idea of what the, the functional brief was. We would then need to come up with a, a concept design, take that through a developed um, avenue. And if we were to go through um, a traditional approach versus a design and build approach, where we take on the onus of the design, then the, 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 the time to market um, in a traditional approach is, is much longer than a design and build approach. Um, so it, one of the first things we would have to do is choose which way we would try and go to market. And what drives that um, decision is your timeline plus your appetite for risk. Um, if you go with a traditional approach, um, as a counselor, as a, as a client, you carry the design risk, um, if, uh, but you get the advantage of controlling 
uh, what it is that gets built. If you go with another, uh, the uh, design and build avenue, um, the designer and the builder take the, the design risk, but as client, you lose all control. Um, as far as, uh, as cost is concerned, if you take a traditional approach, the upfront cost lies predominantly with um, the client. Um, but when you do go to market, um, you find that the risk that is carried by the contractor really limits and reduces your contractor pool. Uh, so you carry a risk there that you may go to market and not be able to get to the person or the, the entity that you want um, to actually carry out the work. So therefore your, your risk profile, once again, is a lot higher. At um, the moment we carry, at the moment our design carries very little risk uh, and we have a, a very strong uh, understanding of the costs involved because of where we've gone to with it and knowing our um, functional brief, we also, also have been able to maintain control of the outcome. Okay. Um, uh, Andrew, I, I hope that's been so sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, Glenn, I can see that um, Steph has yeah. <laughs> had her hand, hand up for quite some time with regards to this question, so I'll hand across to her. Um, thank you through the mayor and apologies uh, to Antoinette for jumping the queue. Um, look, just uh, to answer your question, uh, Deputy Mayor, succinctly, we have not come here today prepared uh, to talk about uh, what a redesign might look like in the process. Um, and so I really appreciate um, Glenn and Drew's perspective on that, but I just really wanted to make the statement that we are giving you our best opinion. Um, I think there will be, uh, and I don't want to interrupt the flow of the questions now, but I think it will be a question that we may need to revisit when we start to talk about consultation options because um, it will impact uh, our discussion there. So I can leave most of, uh, if, if you're happy with that, we can leave some of that discussion uh, for when that question arises uh, in the conversations today. So thank you, um, Mia. I just wanted to point out that um, we are giving our best opinion, but um, we haven't done any work on what a redesign would look like, how far back that might impact um, things like consultation, uh, and so um, up for that discussion if need be, but thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, um, Steph. And Antoinette, you had your hand up before. Did you have something to add to this question? Uh, Sorry, through, through the chair, um, I guess just further to Steph's comment, um, even more succinctly to answer uh, the Deputy Mayor's question, a redesign um, will take um, significantly more time and cost and will require a new business case um, to be factored into the long-term plan. It will probably come with additional or adjusted, um, operation, an adjusted operational model um, for council's consideration and will require additional consultation. So um, I hope that does answer your question a little bit more succinctly, Annette. Thank you. Um, thanks, Antoinette. But I would just actually like to reiterate what Steph said, that we don't actually know at this point in time um, what a redesign would encompass in terms of a work program and what would be required. We'd need to seek additional information on, on that, so, um, and we can, of course, yes, discuss that further when we start debating. Um, now, Councillor Crown, did you have a question specifically with regards to a redesign, or was it a different question? Oh, you're Sorry, I'm mute. having all sorts of problems with the unmute. It is um, related, but I'm happy to steer away from the wording redesign if that makes it um, more appropriate for me to be able to uh, ask my question. Go for it. Thank you. Um, so I suppose it is along a similar line of questioning, but my focus is actually around the regional pool network and the changes that may have occurred in that space um, since the... Um, the design was approved in March 2019, knowing that that was also influenced by the 2015 aquatic strategy. So just looking at those timeframes and trying to get an idea of um, if we were to conduct a needs assessment now, how that might impact or the, or the changes that that could um, create in, in a design um, that we would look to build. 
Okay, thanks, Sally. So um, just trying to feed back the question to make sure I'm interpreting it correctly. Um, the design that we have um, developed over a few years of work has been informed by um, the Napier Aquatic Strategy in 2015 and all that sort of work. Um, there has been some recent changes, largely really it's the, um, the Minor 10 Sports Park pool, um, which is a, is a big significant regional asset. Um, it's going to bring benefits to lots of people and, and, and really it's around, I think, um, what is the impact of Minor 10 Sports Park on us. The other, the other potential changes are Greendale coming back online um, and whatever happens with, with Ocean Spa or Marine Parade pools next year. So both of those facilities were included in the original assessment in 2013 in the National Facility Strategy. Um, so um, there's no additional provision there. So, so I think what I'm saying, or what I'm hearing you say, is what impact will the Mitre 10 Sports Park pool have on our needs? Is, is, that, is, that, is that it? Okay, so... Um, Obviously, the pool is not ready yet. Um, there is a whole bunch of work to do. Uh, I think um, I was there on Monday, actually, with my hard hat on standing in the tank, and the project looks fantastic. Um, they are looking for a start time, an opening time of 1st of August this year. Um, as you are probably already aware, we've got a, a really big um, deep water tank, and standing in it, it's, you know, it's well above it, the head height. So it's 2.2 metres 2 .2 metres deep along the 50 metres the whole way. Um, which means that it's really good for activities such as structured swimming, um, such as uh, club training, such as events, um, and also sort of deep water aerobics and that sort of stuff. Um, and people that are capable swimmers that want to go and do health and fitness sort of swimming. Um, they've also got a, a, a really sizable learn to swim tank as well. And they've got smaller sort of hydrotherapy pools on, on the side there. So um, we haven't gone into it to any great degree, and there's still a fair bit that's that's up in the air. But the assumptions at this stage are that, um, and from talking to Aquahawks, who you know they've they've got the Napier Aquatic Centre as their home, and they have been for quite some time, um, they see themselves as potentially using the pool for some of the um, you know the the longer distance type training for some of their you know really advanced swimmers. But they still see the Napier Aquatic Centre in whatever form it takes moving forward as as their home. Um, and, and I guess the rest of the, um, our pool is a community pool. Our pool has always been geared around meeting the needs of the people of Napier. Um, with that comes the, op uh, the issues of accessibility and um, you know, fitting it into their lives so people can come and use the facility, whether it's close to work or close to their home. Um, so while I can't put my hand on my heart and I haven't done any studies or anyone else has done any studies on that, but um, my assertion is at this stage that there will be some um, custom that will go there. There will be some people that will go there and there's always a new pool phenomenon that all oh, this is a nice new shiny thing and I want to go there instead of where I've been going. Um, but my assertion would be that demand would probably, any impact on demand um, would even out over time um, and, you know, return to pretty much our, um, where we are to date. Um, I did answer the question um, from Maxine around the impact on learn to swim. And, and again, that is um, putting yourself in the shoes of, of a mum or a dad who's trying to get their two kids to learn to swim during a busy week, um, juggling work and other out of school activities and that sort of thing. Um, the hypothesis at this stage is that um, that extra, you know, 20, 20 minutes either way, so 40 minutes round trip will just mean that it's, um, you know, it's, it's too tough for a lot of people that are based in Napier to get over there. Um, I will maybe call on Jeff if you're still online, mate, to see whether you've got anything to add to that. To add to that question, M mainly around the accessibility and the, um, I suppose, the catchment areas that normally service uh, aquatic facilities. Yes, thank you, Glenn. Um, and as we found, in, in even just doing the site assessment, um, certainly uh, for elected members, the current imperative for people using pools is that they drive to them. So yes, at somewhere around 91 plus percent of pool users seeing a car journey to be part of their aquatic experience, uh, we already have uh, the situation where people will drive to where they want to go. Um, so in other words, your selection of a pool location isn't necessarily driven by uh, its, its simplicity to walk to or bike to. Those numbers are low. However, um, one of your strengths is you have a public transport system and, and so forth. So that's, that's the work we focused on. Um, I think in the main, as Glenn's saying, um, from personal experience in opening brand new 
pools and cities, and we're working on a few right now around New Zealand. Uh, there is the honeymoon uh, factor issue where you open a new venue and most people go check out. Um, however, when you do those uh, exit interviews or those surveys of clubs, um, there are some quite specific needs to communities and your strategy seems to be mostly driven towards community pool use. So that is learn to swim, clubs, training, recreation programs. Uh, in effect, that's the business you've already articulated for yourself. Um, so it's all the things that you're not seeking in Naked City might mean that uh, you'll find a new facility that's ultimately a regional journey, uh, not necessarily being, uh, not necessarily robbing from your market. Your market, as we've learned, is, is quite urban orientated. So um, it is about um, user groups that, that want to be comfortable with a tank uh, that's got reasonable proximity to the way they live. And I think, as we've seen, the imperative isn't to take on big car journeys to, to big facilities. So that's not driving your business as, as we understand it. I think around the country, though, and we've had this in Tauranga, we've opened um, new facilities and upgraded facilities. Uh, there's definitely that, um, that check it out phase. People do, um, and the user figures bear this out. People will go there and see it. Uh, but unless it's uh, a journey they are planning to make often, it's not a draw in your core business all the time. That's a little bit of anecdote, but it tends to play out. Um, you always factor it in with the new pool. Um, will this lead to a duplication? Will this rob from one business and take it to another? And because new facilities are driven by business plans that already factor that in, you tend to uh, be quite safe with your high level of data confidence around the people that will use your pool and how often. So, sorry, long answer, but... Um, uh, I don't believe that that's uh, a massive concern long, concern long term beyond uh, the opening excitement and a period of checking it out. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jeff. And the only other thing I'd add to that is that um, we do have a regional network and developments within this regional network need to consider what we have and what we don't have. Um, we've talked about what is going to be at the sports park and um, we haven't talked about what's not going to be at the sports park and it is it is not a leisure and play facility there's no zero depth type play there's no hydro slides um, there's no outdoor area and that kind of thing and and those those uh, comprise a really big bulk of our users particularly on the weekends that are coming to you know to, to have fun and splash and, and have fun with their family so that's um, there is no competition there at all. The only area that it may impact is our health and fitness swimmers and, and potentially the club swimmers. Does that answer your question, Councillor Crown? Uh, thank you, Glenn, and for that comprehensive answer. I, I would just comment that um, I have had some conversations with the um, regional sports park uh, pool people for want of a better description and I understand that there is ongoing conversations with with Aqua Hawks about what their usage may be um, and I do understand that Greendale have already committed to taking um, their teams there to train. I've also um, been advised that at a national level Swim NZ are looking at uh, trying to ha have regions join together in terms of their swim clubs and have one swim club. I believe it happened quite recently in Waikato. And there's a, a, a likelihood that Hawke's Bay, that's a conversation they'll be having with Hawke's Bay in the not too distant future, rather than having um, a splintered and competing number of swim clubs in the region, actually um, working with them to, to pull them together. So, so that would presumably mean that they would all be training at one place as well. Um, and I also had confirmed by the um, regional team that their primary source of income will be learn to swim. And I think it would be naive of us to, to think that that's not going to impact us in some way. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that we can discount that there will be an impact in terms of particularly lane space um, and learn to swim with when the regional pool um, comes online. So I'll just add those comments from some of the um, research that I've been doing. And I will now move to Councillor Brown for a question. Uh, yeah, good morning. Mine's off a slightly different topic. Um, 
I still have a level of discomfort with signing off on this 8.6 million to put into a pool that we're looking to knock down in a few years. Um, obviously, I can understand that for a 10 year time frame, but uh, reading the room, I don't think we're actually looking at 10 years. So firstly, I'm keen to check what the actual timelines we're looking at are. Um, so based on the timeline you've given us in the info pack, I understand the Preberson option could be built as early as September 26. So my question is, if we built it option one at Onakawa, will the existing pool need to be closed during construction of the new one? And based on those timelines that you've already given us, um, roughly what year would we be looking to close the pool for construction? If the answer is yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Brown. And through the Mayor. Um, the, the operational impact of constructing on Onikawa uh, does depend on which option is chosen. Option one, which is really over, over the top of the tennis courts, it takes it a long, a long way from, the exist, from most of the existing thing. There may be an impact on the pavilion and there may be an impact on the um, Allen's pool, the small learn to swim pool, and potentially the gym area as well. Um, option one, which is a bit more in the centre of the of the existing courtyard, will have a bit more of a significant impact on the operational provision. Um, so that will mean that definitely Allen's Pool, definitely the uh, the pavilion, definitely the gym. And I'm not 100% sure about the uh, the old pool, but Drew, maybe you can confirm for me. No, the, um, the, 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 the positioning that we've chosen is to have a minimal effect on the operations of the existing. Um, it would possibly have a, an impact on the splash pad and the hydro slides, but hopefully we'll be able to maintain levels of service in the Learn to Swim and the Ivan Wilson. Yeah. Um, and there was another part to your question, Hayley. Can, can you, sorry, can you just say the last bit of it? Yeah, so, um, so just um, making sure I've got that right. So we'll be constructing, based off your timelines you've given us, um, sort of from mm, start of 27 through to 29. Um, so we could probably say that by about 2028, we would have a reduction in the level of service at Onakawa if we chose that site. Is that roughly, if we go with this timeline and all of the other caveats that go with that? Um, I think roughly that's a that's a relatively safe assumption. Um, I will just share my screen quickly so everyone can see what um, the, the the bits that you're talking yeah. about. So this is a high level construction time frame um, showing the process of uh, Prevenson and Onikawa. So given that Prevenson is about thirty something months shorter in in um, period from from now to opening the doors, basically. Um, the intention, the intention is potentially on September 2026, uh, we could be opening and um, compared to any carver with that much longer time for master plan and commencement of enabling works, um, that's that's January 2029. Um, in terms of the operational impact, then, then yes, there'll be nothing happening there necessarily until the start of um, enabling and consent work. So I would imagine that from around about the middle of 2025, 26, there will start to be an impact on some of those um, some of those aspects of the current facility. Right. So in essence, we're looking at about four years, four to six years for the existing pool, rather than the 10 year that we, if, if this time oh. frame was to work. Um, yes, yes, that's right. I mean, at, at the moment, we've assumed a 10 plus year life, and that's the assumption yeah. for all of the work that's been done for the remediation of the existing pool. Um, if that time frame is shortened, um, whichever option we proceed to, as soon as we've got certainty around that date, we can start to flow that into the impact of the, on the remediation that's required, um, which may mean um, looking at each of the individual items slightly differently, um, having a and I, I don't like using the word very much, but having a just good enough solution rather than, you know, a solution that's going to last 10 years and, you know, starting to look at the scope of alternative designs, or alternative solutions to get us through to that, um, to that date, whenever that date will be. Yeah, so that's sort of the second part of my question is sort of what does that process look like? So if we sign off on the full 8.6 million and it's not required, how, what does the process look like for us to bring the scope back? in line okay. with. Thanks, Haley. And Steph has got her hand up, so I'll, I'll throw, to, throw to Steph for that one. Uh, thank you, Glenn. And through the Chair, um, Councillor Brown, 
Just firstly, and I know that you know this, but one of the caveats, of course, is public consultation, uh, which uh, we are uh, recommending in this case. And so while we can give you like the fast fact fast track, fast track option, I, just for the purposes of not being predetermined about what that consultation might bring, it could change. Um, with respect to the 8.6 million, um, and you would have uh, seen that, uh, you know, Drew has done some work about how that could be spent from a project management point of view and a scheduling point of view. Um, we're still really conscious that, um, just like there's a caveat for the delivery of the poll, there's also some unknowns for us as we go through this project. So what we are recommending is, um, a $4 million, $4 million split uh, with the second lot of money we would come back uh, to you for approvals through an annual plan or, or whatever the appropriate process is. And the reason that I am sticking uh, to that $4 million uh, at this stage is that, in, in granted councils, you haven't had the opportunity to get into the detail of this, but you can program manage it in a way um, that decisions are put off uh, until they are absolutely necessary and the bulk of that expenditure could be like the bell curve is in the middle of that time, so we spread it across from a risk perspective. Uh, for the purposes of councillors um, understanding um, how we might spend that money, what we have uh, tried to achieve here is to be prudent and to say, you know, you, you need to spend approximately $8.6 million on health and safety improvements um, and service continuity improvements to extend the life of a poll five to ten years. You are going to be obviously expecting me to do a lot more work about that uh, and to come back to you uh, with potential, potentially with um, more approvals process yet to be discussed or potentially with different reporting. So I guess I just want to make the statement that um, the conversation was making me a little bit nervous because of that caveat about community consultation. And secondly, it is up for debate as to if that money is allocated in the annual plan, which is what we are recommending, what sort of processes and procedures do you want to put around that for it to be spent? Brilliant. That's the assurance I was looking for. Correct. Thank you. Okay, I'm Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Uh, thank you, Mayor Wise. Just while we were talking um, about consultation and those previous um, options, as, as well as kind of the idea of going um, back and, and possibly recosting, I just wondered if we had Natasha on the call. And if we did, could I ask um, sort of how realistic it would be for us to consult on isolated compartments um, of this? So, for instance, consult on location, but not include indicative costs or the design of the location option. Um, I'm just wondering if, if there's someone with some consultation expertise that could address that for me. Um, thanks, Annette. And yes, I do believe Tash is online somewhere, so. Um... Kia ora. yes, I am here um, through the Mayor. Thank you for the question, Councillor Brosnan. Um, my understanding is that there is a desire to uh, do a two-phased uh, consultation approach whereby we talk with the community and get their feedback on the, the options, um, which haven't been completely um, determined as yet. Um, and that, that first phase consultation we would recommend as being a special consultative procedure, given that it is a significant, it, it hits all the significance criteria within our policy. Um, in terms of breaking up information uh, into location and then design and then other matters, that actually doesn't meet the thresholds that we need to um, meet the special consultative procedure with. So when you go out with options, you need to provide all of the information that you have about those options. And they, that level of information needs to be like for like. So it's my understanding that we do have um, significant information that we can share with the community um, because if you're thinking about location, um, and it was mentioned a little bit before when we were talking about proximity to schools, um, we're talking about the same facility in different sites but costing different amounts. Um, so I think the, the, the key thing here is that we need to be providing all of that information and then the community can determine which of those things are important. So 
if we were just to say, well, which location do you like? Um, and, and people chose, say they chose Onikawa um, and didn't know how much that would cost, then they're not providing informed feedback. So the short answer <laughs> is no, we couldn't split it all up and go out um, section by section, if you like. Our responsibility will be to provide all of the information about each option. And then with the second phase being another special consultative procedure based on a decision pathway that you've made after the feedback of, of the community around those options, would be more focused on uh, the options selected and then the pathway around funding mechanisms and timing. And that would be through the LTP amendment. And that would also consider all those other factors that were talked about in terms of rates, caps, and any other implications for the rest of council business. Yeah, that's really helpful, Natasha. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McGrath. Yeah, just heading back um, to CE Steph, um, money to be current, the, oh, the $8 million that's being put aside for the current facility, um, I understand $5 million of it is for health and safety. Now, do we, because it's health and safety and we've got staff on site and we've got um, swimmers coming in or aquatic users, do we have an obligation to pretty much get on with that? Um, so thank you for the question and, and through the Mayor. Um, absolutely, if a health and safety issue was um, pressing, I have all of the obligations to minimise any risk and to, and to get on with that. Um, the, the slight point of difference in the conversation that we're having now is that we are needing to be prudent. We know that we have an ageing facility, so the team and I have tried to foreshadow um, or the issues that we see um, that needs to be done over the next few years. So when it comes to prioritisation of those issues, Councillor McGrath, the health and safety ones are going to have to be addressed up front. But if I was going to, um, you know, rip into a building and address something, um, the other prudent question I have to ask is, is there anything else I should do while I'm doing this? Um, Am I fixing this risk in the short term, the medium term, or the long term? And so that's what I mean in the spirit that there are still some dependencies as to um, whole of life, as to what sort of job I would do. So to answer your question, um, health and safety uh, issues need to be addressed and they are pressing. Um, however, I think that there is still some work that you would expect me to do with this work program on the overall costs of those uh, of um, of the jobs at hand. So just trying to ask for a little bit of flexibility as we move forward this debate, uh, move forward with this debate and uh, as we hear from the community. Um, if, for example, we get to, oh, and the other point I wanted to make, sorry, before I start um, crystal ball gazing is that there's no one, there's no ones and there's unknowns. Um, and so, uh, well, we have done our absolute best to foreshadow the health and safety component of that, something could happen tomorrow and it would just need to be fixed as well. Um, what I was going to say, however, is that um, there's uh, potentially different ways of uh, addressing these depending on how long uh, I need to uh, run the site for um, and how long it needs to be open for. I can see... Um, Glenn has got his hand up, so I might just throw back to him, and then you can come back to me if you if you've got further questions, Councillor McGrath. Glenn. Yeah, thank you, Steph, and, and through the mayor. Um, I guess the only thing I really wanted to add to that that if any risk has been identified throughout this process, that is immediate risk of health and safety, that kind of thing. And obviously, we we don't need to go to council. We're not going to come to you guys to say, hey, should we um, should we fix this to make sure someone doesn't die? So. Um, the building asset management team and our operational team um, have been and will act on those straight away to, to avoid those immediate risks. So. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, no more hands up. So final opportunity if anyone wants to ask a question. Um, otherwise, I will actually now ask governance um, if they could please pop up on the screen the officer's recommendation that's in the report. But also um, I am just foreshadowing that I have added some additional bullet points to that, um, which I will be moving for us then to go into debate. And, and I guess just while we wait um, for governance to bring that up, I just want to comment um, further on the conversation with regards to consultation and um, basically just to, to reaffirm that absolutely all information that we have gathered over the, the years while we've been considering this decision would absolutely need to be made available to the community. I mean, that's that's the... That's the whole point, actually. That was the commitment that we made to the community when we pressed pause. So um, that, that's that's a given. And from my perspective, it's actually about how, how we present that in the consultation document. And I have sought legal advice on the um, suggestions that I've made in here, which are highlighted, and they do meet all the requirements of the Local Government Act. Um, and you will note that there is a point in here about a web page being developed that presents all of the information in one place um, for people to um, access. So, um, I, as I said, I, I'm going to be moving what is in front of us, um, and I would ask for a seconder, please. And unfortunately, I can't see people. Excuse me, um, Mayor Wise, uh, before we move into this debate, can I please check with you and your councillors if we can um, release our experts? Ah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, should have, um, I should have framed that better. I mean our external experts, <laughs> the, the experts need to stay. So um, on behalf of our council, can I please thank um, the team that's joined us today um, and we will get you on speed dial if we need you from here on in. Thank you, Mia Weiss. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mia Weiss, can I ask a question of clarification on your intro there? Yes. Um, you mentioned you'd received legal advice that meets all the criteria in the special consultative process in the LGA. Um, that seems potentially to conflict what Natasha was saying earlier. I wonder if you could circulate that legal advice to councillors? It was a verbal conversation, but essentially what I'm saying is that in terms of the resolution, we do not need to go into a significant level of detail around what the consultation document would include. So the reason that I have kept this relatively high level is because I don't want to tie us into specifics at this stage of the process. And so I did want to check in with the lawyers that um, was there any issue in not including a prescriptive um, consultation map in the resolutions and that's what I had confirmed. Okay, thank you. I'll second it, Maxine. Thank you, Councillor Bogue. Uh, and I will just advise that I, I will suspend Standing Order 21.6 because um, I'm sure that there are a number, if not all councillors, who would wish to speak to this. Um, so just to launch into to my views, uh, two years ago, council unanimously agreed to pause the aquatic facility project that was proposed in the 2018-2028 long-term plan. Uh, this was to assess the feasibility of constructing a new aquatic centre at Onikawa Park and to compare this with the feasibility of constructing at Prebinson Drive. We know this is of incredibly high interest to the Napier community and it is a significant investment. So we need to, needed to ensure that we had comprehensive information to help with our decision making and um, we certainly have that in front of us now. Council direction at that time 
requested full costings for the proposed design at both locations because we hadn't had that previously. And we also directed um, for a different design to be looked at for the Onikawa location. The paper before us today covers detailed analysis of the original proposed design, which was based on the Curie 2 facility in Christchurch um, at, at the two locations. It includes an estimated spend of 70 million for the Prevenson site and 110 million for the Onikawa site options. No alternative design options have been presented at this stage. This is an intergenerational asset for Napier. So it is absolutely vital to ensure that the design and location suits the needs of our community and that we undertake an appropriate level of investment in the facility. We also need to consider whether the proposed design is fit for purpose, particularly in light of the Greendale swimming pool reopening, the ocean spa facility due to come under council management from January of next year, and the new complex at the regional sports park, which includes a 50 metre pool, a 25 metre learn to swim pool and two hydrotherapy pools. It would be naive to think these changes in pool space provision won't have an impact on the availability of lane space and the learn to swim at our facility. Cost is another factor to take into consideration. The rates impact is between six and 9.3% based on the current three options. Personally, I cannot support an investment of 70 million or more in an aquatic facility when we are about to go out for consultation on the potential sale of our 377 pensioner and social housing due to affordability issues. We need to cut our coat to suit our cloth. We all agree that our current aquatic aquatic facility is ageing and no longer meets our community's needs. However, it is vital we balance social and community need with prudent use of funding. The right facility in the right place for the right investment. Whilst I appreciate that the escalating costs in the construction sector are a very real risk, we also need to honour the commitment we made to our community to have full input into this important intergenerational asset. So as such, as outlined in uh, the recommendation before us, I'm proposing that consultation is undertaken in two stages. And we do need to move as quickly as we can with the consultation phases of this. So in 2022, and we have discussed this with the Chief Executive, uh, we can, uh, it, it, it will be a tight push, but we can meet a sort of early July deadline to undertake the first phase of the consultation on the location of the aquatic centre. And then in 2023, consultation will be undertaken on the design, timing and funding, with the final decision being adopted as part of the 2020, uh, no, so being adopted as an LTP amendment in next year's annual plan. So we need to get this right. Uh, there's been too many mistakes made already. And I think that the process outlined um, in the resolution provides us with the best opportunity to fully engage with our community and how we move forward with this project. So I will open up to councillors to speak to the motion. I have a question, please, Kirsten. Sorry, I can't get my thing to work. <laughs> yep, go for it. <laughs> my hands up thing. Your hands um, up. When you when you say consultation completed by July twenty two, is that an answer as to the location as well? We sit on the consultation and make a decision. So that that is the whole purpose of that phase of the consultation is to decide on the location. On the location. Oh, yeah. It just was. Being suspicious comes with the pool. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Councillor Bode. Yes, I'm not, I'll reserve my comment on the motion, but I just had a question, uh, Neil Wise. In the original 
uh, paper that um, was on our agenda. Uh, C is endorse an additional $8,626,435 of capital funding. Um, your recommendation, we can't see it, but I did print it off from your um, email this morning or yesterday. Uh, C is endorse an additional $4 million. I just wondered where that discrepancy, $8 million, $4 million, and what, how did you make that decision? Thanks. So as advised um, by the chief executive earlier, the uh, phasing has been retained across two years and the cost of the health and safety and um, service continuity elements is, is what the four million relates to. So we're actually separating that out to, to today endorse that expenditure. But then we are essentially saying that we don't at this point in time want to fully commit to the additional 4.6. And so by breaking the two out like that, there is an opportunity, it, it creates the opportunity for the 4.6 million to actually come back through council for approval, um, should it be required. Thank you. Uh, um, sorry, through you, Madam Mayor, I, ap I appreciate it's hard to see our hands up. Um, so just actually um, confirming what the Mayor has said, but to Councillor Bogue, the original paper did have a 50-50 split of the expenditure over the two years. So we are just proposing uh, to stick with that um, in the spirit of 4, 4.6 this time. So that expenditure um, remains as it was debated in the uh, Sustainable Nike Extraordinary Meeting. However, uh, we are essentially asking for 4 million through the annual plan paper, which is also on your agenda today. Kia ora, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, you know, this isn't an easy topic, and I'm sure it's not a topic we'll get unanimous views on, but it is a topic um, that has sort of a whole lot of elephants in the room that need addressing, um, and I um, congratulate you because this is the first time we've had um, the decision to consult on the table, um, and putting that on now, I think it's the right time to be discussing it. So um, I support you, Kirsten, putting that consultation option on the table now, um, and I'm happy to speak to the concept, um, I suppose, of putting our leadership boots on, um, like I said, at one of our workshops. And I think for me, that means giving everyone some certainty and some clarity in the questions in front of us um, so that the community and the council can move forward together. And so, you know, the, the, the resolution answers the question, when will we consult? But it doesn't for answer the question, when, we will, when will we make a decision? Um, what site options will we consult on? Um, it gives no certainty on what information we will provide the community in that consultation. It directs our staff to go off and prepare consultation material without any process or timeframes for, for how that will be developed. It doesn't um, give confidence in the transparency that we're going to provide all the information on the site um, options, and it doesn't give clarity to that question on should we pick a preferred location or should we engage um, in, in, in not doing that. So for me, there's, there's no clarity on what the site alternatives will be as well in this consultation, which is really important. Um, you know, the community, I think, felt like we were potentially going to abandon Onikawa and it's, um, if, if that site was not chosen. And for me, it is really important that as part of our consultation, we include the alternatives for the, the site that's not chosen. So the resolution sort of raises some significant questions for me that aren't addressed. So I'll be speaking against the motion um, in front of us and just foreshadowing that I have an alternative motion that if this one is lost, I think comprehensively sets out how we could move forward with clarity on the options with transparency, with all the information, and most importantly, to keep the promise we made, that we would fully consult with the community this term. You know, I intend to answer in that foreshadowed resolution, what are we directing our staff to go away and prepare consultation on? That's missing from me. When 
we propose to make a decision that's missing from EA. How we cannot consult on the location and not be transparent on the indicative pricing design in EA that's removing the smoke and mirrors around costs. How can we not consult on location and be transparent with the site alternatives for each option? How can, how can we not make a decision on the design until phase two, once the location and costs have already been consulted on? Got a barking dog in the background, sorry. <laughs> um, how we shouldn't how we should not remove the double debate on the consultation document, which is missing in G. Um, I have no appetite at all for going back to the drawing board on, on, and redesign discussions. We know um, the time and cost, and we know the significant changes that we have already made to this design uh, to meet our needs. And that's, that's not an F. Um, if there is, not detail on what we're consulting on. How is this resolution moving us forward? I suppose is where I, I get to. I think it's not transparent to try and consult on bits and pieces of this project in isolation. And we heard Natasha speak to that before. How can we consult on location? Which site do you want? Without telling people the costs um, and that the difference is in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, and years, time, risk, all of that stuff need to be included in our options. And so it's, it's just trying to shield people from the truth and from the reality um, of the, the decision that we need them to give us guidance on. So, um, you know, for, for all of the experts' reasons that we heard earlier, um, you know, going back to the drawing board at this late stage and looking at design later as part of stage two, which this resolution does, um, you know, it's, it's given, we've already made huge changes um, and we know the time and the inflation cost if we were to go back and do that. I was trying to write down the process. It's, you know, it's a, it's a new brief, it's a new concept, a new developed design, a new functional requirements, a new time to market, a new business case, adjusted operational model. Um, I think it is unfair to Napier to go back to that kind of level of detail. Um, and and um, I'm completely open to exploring cost saving options in conversations ahead of phase one but no appetite personally to delay phase one a further year, two years, who knows? Like Steph said, we didn't come prepared for an option for a redesign conversation. Um, we can't design this by committee. So we followed a good process with the aquatic strategy setting. Um, we set our brief um, and, and I'm not interested in throwing that out now. Um, our strategy considered Greendale and it considered Ocean Spa. Water space will always change in this region. And what we've built into the design is a huge amount of flexibility um, so that we can adapt to that all as, as that changes. So, you know, if we add that time and cost, business case, et cetera, no, we're, we're far um, pushing that decision out to 2024, then you're approaching another election in 2025, which is just an opportunity to procrastinate again. So when we look for every decision to delay consulting on the good information we have, the, the truth of the findings that we have, we delay making a decision now because it's not convenient. It's never going to be convenient. It's never going to be cheaper. Um, and I think it's dishonest what we said we would do. We said we would consult on the real options this term, and I intend to keep that promise. So I agree with the Mayor that this is an important decision for our community. It's important that we take the time, and we have taken two and a half years to get that information together to present to them. Um, so I, I don't plan on being complicit in, a, in another decision not to make a decision now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm going to speak against it and I concur with very much what uh, the Deputy Mayor has said. And I'm not going to go over a lot of the things that she's already raised, but I'm actually going to focus on the credibility of this council because, um, you know, it's a basic cost versus location argument. 
And let, as has been said previously, leading into the last local body elections, the aquatic centre debate was in full swing. And it hasn't been mentioned as yet, but the Friends of the Only Car Aquatic Centre issued a legal challenge contending that the council had not consulted correctly over the pool. Well, we all know the result of that, that the council was found in favour of in all cases. And um, at the time of the challenge, we didn't have that result. So many councillors and candidates had to make a decision on what they were going to do should they be elected. And they, we all decided, yeah, let's press pause and promise to reconsult after the 2019 election. We know what the challenge, how the challenge went. We are now approaching 2022 election, 30 months into this triennium of 36 months, and we still haven't made a decision. To compound this, we now know, and I think the Deputy Mayor mentioned at one of the previous meetings, we now know that the only car we pull is a pig and we're trying to put some lipstick on it. So, you know, yourself, the Mayor, and all of the candidates were asked to make public statements about what they would do in relation to the pool should they be elected to this council. And these statements were provided to the Friends of the Onikawa Aquatic Centre and they were published on their Facebook page and they were used on a flyer to discredit many candidates who were against it. And they were put into the letterboxes of every house around Napier with a tick, support this person or whatever. I'm happy to produce the copies of that Facebook page because I've been reading it very carefully over the last few days. I said it was an opportunity to build something aspirational to meet the needs of nature. I'm concerned about the unknown toxicity of the Onikawa site, and there is merit in doing a complete review of the process as proposed by each mayoral candidate. Now, the other council candidates at the time made various comments, and I'm going to quote them just to remind you what you said to the public to be elected. Greg Mawson, I'm a positive person working in a positive environment industry. I will bring this positiveness, clarity, and listening experience to council. I'm willing to communicate with the majority what the majority wants without bias. Sally Crown, candidate. I want to improve council culture and its capacity of listening, poor listening. Engagement is key. What is the mandate from our people? We must work harder to draw out opinions to get better results. We how well, how about now we ask the people what they think? Councillor Rhonda Crystal, the consultation process was seriously flawed. The High Court didn't tend to agree with that. But to continue, the community needs good information to make informed decisions. We now have that information, Councillor Crystal. Councillor McGrath. Sorry to interrupt. Um Councillor Taylor, I'm just conscious you do have a five minute time limit and I'm just wondering if you're intending to read through every single councillor's um, comment on this. Uh, no, not every single councillor's. Thank you. Councillor McGrath, the QE2 pool is the wrong design, wrong location, won't meet the future needs, does not meet Sport New Zealand aquatic guidelines. And comments like that. Well, Richard, I, I know that you read constantly bring up other pools, but I would suggest perhaps you could have a look at the North Coast Aquatic Centre development in, in Melbourne, which is almost an exact design of ours. It's a um, similar catchment area and particularly of interest that they are rebuilding on their current site and the pool will be closed for two years whilst this takes place. Councillor Wise, now Mayor Wise. I am passionate about improving NCC engagement and consultation with its citizens. Committed to proper engagement with stakeholders, leading to an informed decision on site and makeup of the centre rather than rush to a build a vanity project. So, you know, as candidates, we've made that promise. We're almost through that three year period. And I think it's really time 
that instead of pushing it out and pushing it out and pushing it out, that we actually make the decision. And there would be some people that would say, we should just put out one option because that huge variance in cost, 30 million at a price escalation of over 20 million in three years, you know, where there's the possibility a $50 million blow from what it was in 2019. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't know whether I'm up to my five minutes yet, uh, Your Worship. Is there going to be a bell rung or anything? I would be relying on the governance team to do that. I don't do the timing. Um, I, I would just, you know, I'll finish there and um, just say, you know, this council needs to have some credibility. Um, I don't want to be crude and say things, you know, we've just got to get on, make the decision, put the information out in front of the community, let them decide what and where they want it. If they want to spend an extra $50 million, that's, that's them. If they don't want to pull it all, that's up to them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Councillor Brown. Yeah, kia ora. Um, I'm speaking against the motion, but just mainly with one part in particular. And I suppose I'm wary about asking for a redesign. I'm pretty comfortable with looking at the design we've got in front of us and from what we've heard from the experts, that the community outcomes and therefore the functional brief that we're trying to achieve at our facility haven't changed. But I can see that there might be some savings to be able to be made if we relook at materials and the building methodology. So my key concern is about the cost and the time implications that will be, will be occurring in a redesign. So I'm wondering um, if there could be built into our resolution some form of iteration in our decision making, as in could we ask the staff to come back to us with what a review of the construction process might look like, um, cost and timeframes before we give the final approval to go back to square one and do a full redesign. Councillor McGrath. Yes, I, I support the, the Mayor's resolution, but I'd also like to follow on from Councillor Taylor. He only got through half of what I said last time, I think. And uh, I just add what I, what I had on the Facebook site. Um, the design has no bomb pull, no lazy river, no rope swing, no wave pull. Uh, maybe wants a pool, pool complex, not a gym or calf. And for all of this, I think we need to be talking about future water space. And the other bits for me uh, are just add-ons and tack-ons. And the, the other myth that we keep talking about, we keep going back to, it'll never be so cheap. Well, to be honest, if we replace the, the, the pool in the long-term plan with an outfall pipe, it will never be so cheap to build an outfall pipe. So this brings me to, what are our priorities as a council? Have we gone out and asked the public whether they want us to sort housing first or a swimming pool or outfall pipes, aquariums, BTF plants. You know, because we've been playing with this for a while, maybe we need to actually take it back to the community and see where it sits. But um, as, for, as for speed of the process, um, if I look at the only Kawa site, we build pools to last 50 plus years. We build all our other buildings to last 50 plus years. I think we have to under the Building Act. Now, the only car site's only 24 years old. It's had minimum maintenance, admittedly, but the money we're going to be spending on it very shortly will take it a long way. I don't think we need to rush anything um, because, the, you know, like I said, the other, the other pools are going to come on stream in, in Hawke's Bay. And our pool is what it is. It's not, it's not fantastic. It's not going to meet all our needs. But I think if we take our time, we'll get there. And, and the community will tell us where it needs to be prioritised. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm going to be speaking against the proposed amendment. Um, for the reasons that uh, Deputy Mayor set out, I think there is considerable detail missing from the proposed um, resolution. Um, perhaps I would encourage 
um, Deputy Mayor, if she has an alternative proposal, which she um, she makes it. Um, as local authorities, we're compelled through the Local Government Act to ensure prudent um, stewardship and the efficient and effective use of resources in the interests of our district. This pool discussion has been going on and on. It's consumed considerable resource and capacity both internally and externally. The budget figures demonstrate where costs will fall and what cost implications there are in developing a pool regardless of site chosen. I think it's just time that we got on with it. And I think it's time that, we, that those of us that are continuing to choose to delay this project are depriving their community of an asset that our community needs. We can keep putting lipstick on the pig as Councillor Taylor describes it. I'd describe it more as taking a, a, creating a purse out of a sow's ear. And you'll notice that I've misquoted that quote because it normally says a silk purse, purse out of a sow's ear. We're not going to be making a silk purse. We're going to be limping an aging asset that had poor design features that makes it a vulnerable environment in its current existence. We know that by building a new pool to meet new and modern standards, we will overcome some of the significant financial burden that this community is going to face if we maintain operations over a prolonged period of time at the Onikawa site. I would encourage um, councillors just to think carefully about progressing this pool in a more expedient and effective manner to ensure that our, council, our, our community actually gets the economies that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Councillor Bogue. Uh, yes, I am speaking in favour of the motion and um, just by means of background, last night I received two emails, uh, the first at 7.40 from their wise, um, outlining this particular um, motion that we're now debating. And then an hour later, one from Deputy Mayor um, Annette Brosnan, which um, expanded on the resolution that Mayor Wise had put in front of us. So trying to be bringing these together, um, I suggest that we, uh, the only real difference apart from that the Mayor has suggested directing council officers to further explore further design options, including modifications to reduce costs prior to the second stage of consultation, which was not included in um, Deputy Mayor's um, amended motion or expanded motion, um, I would suggest we go ahead and vote on uh, Mayor Kirsten Wise's um, um, recommendation. And perhaps as one of the, as a seconder, I would not be against the extent, extended um, points that were made by Councillor Brosnan, if that's what she is um, <coughs> foreshadowing as producing when or if this particular motion fails. Um, I, I don't see why we couldn't incorporate them all in, in one motion because that seems to be uh, in effect what has been done by Deputy Mayor Annette Brosnan in the email she sent us all last night. So I'm in favour of this motion. I'm also in favour of an extension to it, incorporating what Deputy Mayor um, has put in front of us as well. Um, so, yep. Councillor Crown. Thank you. Yeah, um, I guess I, I'm a little confused as to why we're not doing what we have done in the past around um, refining um, the motion in front of us, um, rather than sort of coming to this this position where it's um, mine or yours, rather than working together to um, to create something that we can all um, that we can all be be happy with, because um, based on some of the comments and I suppose the the approach that has been taken during this this debate today, um, it's pretty clear that there are some very personal underlying feelings running through 
um, this group of people. And as Maxine just said, what were pre was presented to us um, to help us percolate our thoughts uh, last night are, are two options that are very similar to each other with only a couple of um, points that I would say of contention. And so, yeah, I, I suppose I want to see us work together to bring those to the light and figure out where we stand on those rather than um, making comments around doing disservice to the community, et cetera. Because in my mind on this topic, we have not earned the social license to be able to make a decision on behalf of our community without going to them first. And in my mind, I'm actually delivering on the, the promises and the assurances that I made them when I campaigned by agreeing to go to the, and undertake this consultation at phase one. I think that the information is already out there for them. The next stage for us is how do we package that up? How do we help them to understand it? How do we engage with them and um, encourage them to feed back to us? So yeah, in, in my mind, I'm, I'm supportive of, of, of the motion in front of us, but I'm also supportive of us working together to refine it further and add to it um, if that's what we think we should do, rather than a, have a vote which goes to a no, and then ha have something pretty much near similar be popped up that might become a yes. Why can't we just work towards a yes now? And before I move on to uh, Councillor Mawson, I would just um, like to advise that we shouldn't actually be referring to contents of emails as part of our debate today. And um, I guess I also just want to further to Councillor Crown's um, comments. You know, I we absolutely are all in agreement, I think, here today, um, after listening to people. We're simply quibbling over the wording of a resolution. And so there certainly is the ability to um, look at making adjustments to the one that is before us at the moment. Um, so I'll, I'll pass over to Councillor Mawson and then we will take it from there. Thank you, Worship. Perfect, perfect segue. Thank you very much, Councillor Crown, because that's exactly how I was thinking, and it certainly aligns with my personal values that were reminded to me by Councillor Taylor. Thank you. Uh, we've got Adele with her hand up. Um, thank you, and just through the mayor, just, just a point of clarification, I just do, do want to reiterate what you've said um, through the, you know, as the mayor. Um, that council do have the ability to make amendments to the um, resolutions that are on the table. Um, and I think, as you've mentioned, there's potentially a foreshadowing of some alternative resolutions which council can work through as part of this process. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crystal. I'd just like to say I totally agree with what Councillor Crown said. I think everyone is um, wants to move forward with this. They want to consult. We want the community to make the decision. Just like I said, um, this is a, a big decision for our community and it was a very emotive decision. So um, I think, you know, I support the resolution. I also support, um, you know, if we need to make some tweaks because I don't think we're very far, that's very far apart. Thank you, Councillor Crystal. Uh, so I would just ask if councillors would like to bring up Deputy Mayor Brosnan's um, foreshadowed resolutions up on the screen and then we can have a conversation about how some of the points in that could potentially be incorporated um, into the first resolution. Councillor Taylor, you've got your hand up. Trying to work all these mutes and all these things at the same time, <laughs> you know. Um, 
I, I was just wondering whether or not as a, um, a, a way forward, whether or not there are particular parts of um, Deputy Mayor Brosman's recommendations or foreshadowed recommendations that could just be basically cut and pasted and added to your re recommendation uh, so that we can move this matter forward expeditely. That is exactly what I was intending for us to work through now, is actually go through her resolution and um, move well, some of the points across. Uh, well, I, I mean, sorry, but, but I, you know, having had a quick look at both of them, I mean, there's only a number, not a large number of variations, and so it may be fairly easily done. Um, excuse me, Kirsten, do you want me to put um, your ones side by side to these ones as well so you can see them both together? Yes, please. Okay. And through you, Your Worship, could I just confirm, I think the options in front that the governance team have just put in are not the ones that um, I have foreshadowed. I've um, emailed out to all councillors just now in the governance team the foreshadowed motion, so perhaps we could use that rather than a previous version. Um, thank you for that, Deputy Mayor, and apologies. Um, Kirsten, we may need a short break just to make sure we've got yeah. the right ones and we're bringing them up in a format that will be useful to you. I know that you want to continue this debate quickly, so not suggesting a long break, but just a few minutes, please. Yes, yeah, we will adjourn and take a short break because um, just looking at, at this latest version, it does look like it's there's some quite, for me, um, significant differences to to what was previously put forward. So, um, yeah, if we'll take a minute break, it's been a long Thank morning. You. Thank you, Mia. <laughs> We're
and when I get the thumbs up from John, I think we're back on live. So welcome back, everybody. And um, I think you've probably all got um, the foreshadowed resolution in front of you. Um, so I think actually, sorry, rather than put it on the screen, can, can councillors confirm that they do actually have it on, on a screen in front of them so that we can, great. So as the mover of um, the current motion, I'm intending to move through each of um, the differences that have been put into the foreshadowed um, and indicate what I would be prepared to, to change in terms of my resolution um, as a starting point for this. So if we look at um, basically from E onwards, you will see that as per my resolution, this is around directing staff to prepare for consultation in two stages. Point A is that the first stage will be on location design and indicative costs for a decision prior to July. I am um, happy to amend that other than design. I'm not prepared to include design as part of the first stage of consultation. Ultimately, design or any modifications is much easier to look at if we have made the decision about a preferred site. So that, in my mind, definitely needs to form part of phase two. And that also provides additional time for staff to actually look at that. We should, so, Sorry to interrupt you. Will you take questions of clarification as we go or to discuss at the end? Um, we, we, it's probably best if we take questions as we go because otherwise we'll, we'll land on something and then we'll end up back at square one again. So if Just, anyone has any questions around that? Deputy Mayor. Um, just one, how do we include indicative costs in phase one if we are not including design? We can include the indicative costs of the current designs that we have and the consultation document would refer to the fact that phase two would actually be looking at potential design modifications, therefore different costings. So can I just clarify, Kirsten, you want me to, you're happy with A from Deputy Mayor's uh, recommendation with the exclusion of the word design. You want me to put that into the, your resolution, your recommendation? Correct. Right, okay. And then the insertion of the word design into point B as being part of that consultation stage. I have my hand raised. Oh, Councillor Taylor. I, I just, I still have difficulty with that because basically, if you don't have the design, as the Deputy Mayor has said, you can only include the current indicative price or costs for the community to consult on, and then there's a chance that you're going to change it. So how can they consult on that with the view that, oh, well, what we're talking about now may be changed later. So, you know, to me, it's just, and again, it's, it's creating another consultation at a later point in time if you do change the design. Thank you. Um, if I could just uh, ask the Chief Executive to comment on that, please. Uh, kia ora, and uh, through the Mayor, thanks for the question. So. As has already been discussed today, um, and Natasha, I'm just putting you on notice here, um, as, as has already been discussed today, you are going to have to include all relevant information in that first stage of consultation. And at that point, there will be a design that needs to be included in that first uh, stage of consultation. However, you as councillors, you've had a lot of information. You are within your rights to um, decide what questions are really relevant uh, for the community that you want to seek further guidance on um, and, and seek further um, or be a focus point, if you will. But you will need to provide in the spirit of the LGA and the transparency and your own 
uh, processes, you will need to provide all of that information. So there would be a design that went out. Um, if you got to the stage where you, you are instructing me to be um, prudent and to investigate any cost savings, as I expect you would, um, then we would be able to work through a process with you as to what that might look like. Um, but at some stage, you would have to make the decision whether it was going to be a full redesign or whether it was going to be, um, I'll use the word tweaks, um, in the spirit of what we're talking about here. And that may tip you back into a whole new process if necessary. So um, in summary, um, through the Mayor, you're going to need to include uh, the information that you have today in the consultation and the spirit of transparency. And you may decide uh, certain questions that you want to ask the community, um, such as a focus on location. Can I can I pause there, please, Mia Wise, and, and just um, ask Natasha uh, if she um, can uh, provide further context, and then also um, we, uh, as we said earlier, have got um, the option to ring Jonathan um, Salter if we need to clarify anything going forward. So, Natasha, please. Uh, kia ora through the Mayor. Um, I'd just reiterate um, really what Steph has said. Uh, we would be focusing on options and the features of the options. So uh, to con confirm that we would need to have the design which drives the costs, which drives the features of that option. Another feature of the option is the location. The location itself is not the option. Um, but the feedback that you will get will give you the um, idea from the community which option is preferred and by um, inference, therefore, which location is preferred as well. And if you are able to give all of the information, then you're getting informed feedback. Tweaks to the design are able to be made following your decision on which option you would like to pursue after that consultation. Um, but as Steph says, if there's substantial changes to the design, i.e. things like we'll drop this pool or um, we'll drop the dry facilities, for example, that's quite a different option that you've already gone out to consultation with. So that may trigger uh, further consultation because that's not what you've asked the community in the first phase. So our recommendation would be that you focus on consulting on the options that you would like to take out to the community, of which you talk about location, you talk about what would happen if the other option was pursued to that location, for example, which may trigger more consultation. So um, the example of turning Onikawa into a community park is a decision. Uh, so you may want to keep your options open, and I think we did indicate this in the 2015 long-term plan, that further consultation on the use of that park would be a, a separate process, but that there was indications that you would go back out to the community. Same with Prebinson Drive, for example. So um, I think maybe just turning the thinking around to focus on the options, providing all the information, you can talk about the pros and cons of each option, which is where you kind of emphasize the information that you want to get across. Thank you, Natasha. And um, by all means, thank you to both of you. And Steph, you did articulate very well exactly where my position is on this. Um, I'm not suggesting we withhold any information whatsoever. We absolutely need to ensure that all the information is shared. And for me, the primary focus during the first phase is location. That is the question that our community has never been provided a real opportunity to actually give us their thoughts and feedback on. And so that's why it's quite important to me that yes, we put the options in, in terms of phase one of um, the consultation and, and, and in that vein, point F, which specifies which options would be included, I am quite happy to include that. However, I'm still um, saying that design and whether that be modifications, tweaks, whatever language you want to use, forms part of the second stage of consultation. For you, Your Worship, um, just wanted to draw your attention, my compromise on that particular issue in the 
resolutions and just drawing everyone's attention to I. And I'm not happy with that compromise. I don't believe that that actually, we, we us need to seek input from the community on the design. That's the whole point. It's not that we're gonna do something in house um, and the timing around doing that before phase one is simply unachievable. Excuse me, Mia Wise, just for the benefit of anyone watching, can I just um, read what, uh, thank you governance, what I is. Oh, sorry. Um, so just well, at the, that what the Deputy Mayor was referring to and yourself was direct staff to undertake a review of cost saving opportunities in the design prior to phase one, consultation, document development and adoption. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Councillor Brown. Oh, sorry, Natasha, did you have something to add to that before I go to Councillor Brown? Um, just a something that might be helpful to, uh, to me um, is that at that second stage, um, you are going out again to the community with the with a preferred option, which can include further information about those potential cost saving features. Um, and, and you're giving the community another opportunity at that point to give feedback about that option. So I think you can probably meet what both you, the Mayor and Deputy Mayor are looking for there. And, and it might just be about um, what we mean by design. So we've, we're talking about in the first stage, the current design. And then at the second stage, we would be applying I uh, and, and then going back out to the community with the final costings, the design, um, the impact for ratepayers and how that will be funded, what mechanism would be funded and all of the other effects um, through the LTP amendment. I don't know if that, that might be a bit, that might be helpful. So are you suggesting, Natasha, that in terms of um, point A, we um, modify that to say existing design, and then in point B, we have the addition of um, consultation on the pro um, project, including um, design modifications, timing and funding? Correct. Okay. I can live with that. So, so am I amending something here, um, just to be clear? Do you want uh, me to, are you yes. wanting me to put something back up here on the, in um, this one under E? Do you want existing or current design? Existing design. Yep. And then under B, after pro, uh, the project design modifications. Okay. Councillor Bogue. Thank you. I'm just a bit concerned about the timing of this consultation, um, a decision prior to July 2022. We have two large consultations happening March, April, and I think which is the community housing, then the annual plan, uh, May, June. Um, how practical or how fair on staff is this asking for another um, major consultation um, at that time? Um, I'll yeah, I'll pass yep. across to the Chief Executive to comment on that. Um, and thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for the question, Councillor Bogue. Um, the short answer is that it is uh, doable. However, as you have rightly pointed out, it is all a matter of priorities. So Natasha has been able to just work through very quickly what it might look like if this was the resolution that you landed today. Um, and from our perspective, bearing in mind that it is significant um, and would require the four weeks as well as hearings, we believe, um, we can achieve it in the time frame that the councillors are putting forward. However, what we would strongly recommend to you is that we consider postponing some of the other consultation um, that is scheduled, such as um, the dog control bylaw, um, and potentially some of the other bylaw consultations. So to answer your question directly, it can be done, but ultimately it is a matter of priorities uh, for you as a council and what you want to put forward. Um, it's also 
uh, not just the impact on staff, uh, but the impact on the community with a lot of uh, consultation going on. So that's why we would recommend that we push some um, of the other consultation out slightly. So we can get into the detail of that um, once, potentially once you've uh, landed some resolutions, we can just um, double check that we can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So moving on to F, um, I am very happy to specify the two options with no preferred location. However, I'm not um, happy to include the reference to the potential future use of either of um, the sites. Um, I believe that's something that we would need to do independently of this consultation process. We do not have adequate information to be going out for consultation on, on those at this stage. So that would be the removal of point one under both A and B. And removal of that. Yes, that, that one. one. And yeah. a remove, removal of that one there. Yes, please. Okay. So, okay. Kirsten, also on that one, it's got um, site option one. Have we had a discussion whether we would prefer one or three? We haven't actually had any discussion, um, and, and, and in fact, that discussion needs to be had. Um, so I think we could actually just modify that to say um, one new build, build at one option at Onikawa Park without specifying at this point in time which option it is, so that we can actually consider that um, separate outside of this meeting. I'd, so I'd, do be, I I'd be happy with that. So I, do I take out just the site option one or everything in the brackets as well? Uh, yeah, just take out everything option in the brackets as well. Yeah, and, and yep. everything in the brackets. Just new build at Onikawa Park. Okay. A question from me on that, Your Worship. How would you propose that we have that conversation, if not now, as part of receiving all the reports in favour of which option we should choose at Onikawa, if you know what I mean? I believe that needs to be a separate workshop. There's a lot of information in there that needs um, to be considered and um, considering we've already been debating this um, for three hours, um, you can't have effective decision-making when we're gonna start getting tired. It needs to be done independently. And the formal decision of council, when would you see that happening? Obviously not in a workshop. I don't, I, and again, Natasha could provide some advice on this. Um, I don't know that there would need to necessarily be uh, a formal decision of council on which option we put forward. And in fact, based on the, on the legal advice I had about my original resolution, which didn't identify site options at all, I don't think that there's a legal requirement for us to have a formal decision of council on that. Um, just through the mayor to respond to that, um, that can be dealt with when we bring the consultation um, documents back through sustainable Napier, I believe it would be, or people in places, um, as co confirming the options. Thank you, Natasha. Tara Mia, was you um, noting it's difficult for you at the moment? You do have quite a few hands up. I'm just wondering if I can throw to Glenn. Glenn, if your comments um, flowing on from that previous thread. Yes, they are. Thank, thanks, Steph. Been through the mayor. Um, just wanted to add that the strategy of planning and assessment that um, that Cam did for us um, compared the two options, option one and option three, and also recommended a whole bunch of actions to help us in deciding um, which is the preferred option. So to me, the option of option one or option three is largely um, a council decision working through the ramifications of each and coming up with the best option. So um, there's there's probably a few actions to go through to um, inform that, you know, that workshop or however we choose to proceed to get to one option on Onikawa. Thank you, Glenn. That's really useful. Um, Councillor Brown. Uh, yeah, just uh, foreshadowing, I suppose it's um, 
going to be included in point H if we do. Um, I think it's really important for the public, the bits that we've taken out, that we include the information somehow. So what will be done with the other sites um, at a high level? So with Onakawa, we're talking about a master plan um, and with Tamatea, we don't know. But um, just foreshadowing that if we're taking it out here, I'd really like to see it kept in later. I think there can be a high level reference to it in the consultation document. It's already public knowledge. Um, we have we have publicly stated it previously, and there was in fact a budget in the LTP at one stage um, for the conversion of that Onikawa Park into a reserve space. Um, so I, I just don't think that it actually needs to form part of the resolution because I don't want to give the community um, an expectation that that is what something that we're currently consulting on because it's not. Yeah, I suppose I, I am thinking that high level information and things like, um, I'm pretty sure that Onakawa Park is covered by the Reserves Act. So just to give people reassurance that it's not going to be high rise buildings going in there, that sort of level of information. So moving on to G, um, and I wouldn't mind actually asking the Chief Executive just to provide some comments on, on point A in here. Thank you, Mia Wise. Uh, just checking in that with G, we're talking about the consultation plan and documents be approved by Council. Note direct stakeholder, user group and community engagement to be included. Is that Am I reading the correct one? No. no, I didn't think so. Um, uh, could you? Yeah, the, the consultation document includes informed pieces on the current and projected maintenance and service level okay. continuity costs at Onikawa. Uh, apologies, it's just off my screen. Um, hang on a sec, guys. Um, Glenn, you've got your hand up. Did you want to comment on that? I, sorry, Kirsten, I actually can't see what you're saying. No, sorry. Um, I just had my hand up from last time, so let me take that down. Oh, so you're just that. trying to save me. Uh, apologies, Mia. Can I'll I email, ask you to repeat that I'll, one more time? I'll email it to you because I've just noticed that you weren't included on the email from the Deputy Mayor. Oh, the latest, sorry. The latest version, so it's on its it way. Comes did come separately, sorry, just after the one that council has received, uh, Steph. Ah, oh, gotcha, guys. Um, apologies for that little um, moment I was having there. So what we're talking about is the con consultation document includes informed pieces on the current and projective maintenance and service level continuity costs at Onikawa. Um, yes. I suspect, uh, and if I could just test with the Deputy Mayor the intention behind that, I'm suspecting what you're saying there, um, Deputy Mayor, is that these two discussion, broad discussion points that we're having are still related in the spirit of the um, ongoing maintenance costs that Onikawa uh, would uh, potentially increase depending on the outcome of uh, the consultation. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, each site option and corresponding new build cost has a corresponding effect on the maintenance and running of Onikawa and that that should form part of the co information the community receives when choosing their preferred location. Thank you. So I think what um, we would do in the consultation document, bearing in mind this would still need to come back to council, is in the spirit of um, transparency, what we would say uh, in there is that, you know, Onikawa has if councillors approve, um, say the $4 million today, we would we would include a section that says, you know, Onikawa has had some expenditure in order to extend its life. And then we would also need to provide some narrative about the fact that, you know, um, this it will need further expenditure depending on the outcome of this consultation. And I'd work really closely with Natasha to include it, but we wouldn't be able to provide too many crystal ball figures um, if, if you were going beyond the five to 10 years that we had already um, looked at. So I think there's um, whether or not you want to spell it out um, in your resolutions today or whether or not it's a bit of a given that these are 
uh, related and we would need to explain that clearly in the consultation document. So apologies um, for that confusion, um, Mayor Wise and Deputy Mayor Brosnan. No problem, thanks Steph. Can I suggest that we actually just make that slightly, modify that then um, to actually just say that, that we'll include informed pieces on um, the deferred maintenance requirements at the Onikawa site without it being so specific with the current and projected maintenance and service level continuity costs. So can I just clarify, um, uh, Kirsten, all these ones here that were in and for uh, which actually is a different number, but it's G. Um, are you wanting any of that brought over to the site, or are you um, just going to modify your one over here? If if you, as a first step, if you bring the whole lot across, and then we will modify out of the merged version. Okay. Okay, so there we go. So we've and, got the, yeah. yeah, and so point A would just be amended to um, form pieces on it. The deferred maintenance requirements. Um, Take out the current and projected. Yeah. So just put deferred maintenance and service yeah. level continuity costs at Onikawa. Is that right? Yeah, you could, um, you could. So actually, Mia Wise, apologies for just jumping in. Can I just ask that officers have a few minutes at the end of this to make sure that we um, can do any wordsmithing with these resolutions in their entirety, yeah. rather than rather than messing up the flow and, and getting stuck into it now? Thank you. Yeah. So Carolyn, yeah, just removing the current and projected and just referring to um, deferred maintenance and service level continuity costs at Onikawa. Okay, and what about this one here? Do you want just, that? just remove the I, the point one. Yep. Um, quite happy to retain it point B. And one, two, three, four. Uh, yes, yep. And C. And again, I think that it does, that just needs to be a very high level reference. Um, so if we leave, we leave it there for now as it is, and yep. our council officers to comment on that at the end. Okay. Um, and, and D. Uh, yes, that, that's fine. Okay. And the final one which was here, that one there. Um, that's fine. Okay. So these two, um, these ones here that you had in your original one, we're deleting? Um, I haven't got my original one in front of me, unfortunately. Oh, can so, you not see it on the screen? Oh, uh, it's, no, it's not very big. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my eyesight's not that good. Um, that's Excuse me, um, Mia Wise, uh, I think they were in subject to the Deputy Mayor's views. I think that was in both. Identical. Yeah. Identical, yeah. yeah. Oh, Thank yes, you. that's, yeah, that's retained and it's identical, yeah. So I remove that. No, keep no, um, no, keep that. Oh, keep that as well? Okay. Yes, yeah. So does that become an H? Yes, whatever letter, yes, the next letter we're up to. <laughs> right. Okay. And then, and then I'm proposing um, the removal of I. Um, the removal and I and deputy of, mayors. Of, of the deputy mayors, yes, so don't bring that one across. So don't bring uh, one, right. And happy to bring it across um, the deputy mayors, J. Okay. Oh, was it J? Is that, is that the one about the, this is a priority consultation? I think it was. Uh, direct start, uh, that was J here. Direct staff to undertake a review of cost savings. No, sorry, K. It's K that I want to take across, not J. You don't want you don't want J. No. Okay. Have alternative wording, don't you, Mia Wise for J? In your original. Uh yes, my original was um, point. Uh, where is it? Is it the 
crossed out that. Could Sorry, I just button and ask if Jay could be retained? Sorry, in terms of the discussion that we had with the chief executive about making if this is a priority consultation, then that would mean that other consultations we were thinking of doing, such as some of the bylaws, would be second to that. Yeah, we are retaining so that one. It's, it's, it's gives it's, us the go it, ahead. That's oh, no cool. facts. We are, but it's, but it's just that it's point K on, on the one that's on the screen, not point J. So it's this one here. Yes. So that's moved good. over on to, from your one, it's a J. Yeah, that's and correct. It's, and it's K that I've moved and I've not taken J. That's correct. Right, okay. And then there is, um, so to add in, it was my original F. Your original F. This one here. Direct yes. council officers. Direct, so you want that across the other side for K? Is that what yes. you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Oops. And then I believe the rest of them with regards to the capital review program are identical already. Is that correct, um, Deputy Mayor? Identical. Yes, okay. So these are all the same? Yes. Okay, and so that was just the same as, yep, okay. okay. So um, if, if we could just ask, perhaps Carolyn, if you could email that to um, Steph, who who would you like that emailed to in terms of council officers, just to do a quick review and and make sure the wording's all appropriate? Thank you, Mayor Wise. Uh, Carolyn, could you please email it um, to the Mayor, the Deputy Mayor Adele, myself, and Toinette, and we'll just do a very quick read. Thank you. Do you want me to do you want me to take the red and the yellow and everything off? Um, we'll just leave it as it is. Just leave it as it is. We'll just have a quick read um, and then, Kirsten, we will let you know if we've made any subtle changes. Okay, and I'll leave um, Deputy Mayor's recommendations on the bottom. Okay, I'll do that now. Um, so, yeah, we would appreciate um, Deputy Mayor and Mayor having a quick read as well, just making sure we got everything and we'll do some quick wordsmithing. And actually, you probably need to send it through to all the councillors too. Okay. Mia Wise, while we're waiting for that, could I ask um, an intention around one of the removals? You can. Um, under if the removal, um, where we're noting what we're consulting on, um, we've removed the alternative, for instance, Onikawa be turned into a community park. Just wanted to tease out the intention because I acknowledge it's in there later as an informed piece. For instance, would you see the consultation document having something like, what would happen to Onikawa if aquatics left? And what would happen to Tamatea Park if aquatics, uh, Tom, Tamatea Drive, sorry, if aquatics didn't go there? So I suppose that's what I'm keen to make sure is covered off. And that's why I actually have an issue with it because that in my mind is a completely separate consultation piece. We don't have adequate information, certainly on um, an alternative use of Prevenson. And so then we're not actually able to provide the community with an apple for apple um, conversation about alternate use on both sites. Do you think it's quite important um, when people are making the decision on site location, um, costs, etc., to, for instance, know that we have committed to turning Onikawa into a free-to-use community park and that we would run a consultation process to develop that master plan and that we would assign budget in the LTP amendment ran as part of the annual plan to do that. Because for me as a ward councillor, that's actually really, really important that people know we're not abandoning that site and that there is a future use that council's committed to at a high level. 
And I'm happy to have a, a, a high level informed piece indicating that, but I don't believe it's appropriate to go into a great de um, level of detail. Yep, so. And that is why I was happy to leave in point C of G. Yeah, so we're in agreement that it would form an informed part of consultation, an informed piece. At a very high level, yes. Kind of level I was talking about there? No. I don't believe it should include anything around budget indications or we simply don't have, we haven't had any conversation about that. It's it's not appropriate to include it at that level in this consultation, in my opinion. Sorry, sorry Kirsten, to, to butt in. That was a decision made a very long time ago and a whole lot has changed. In fact, everything's probably changed since. So is it still, rel is that decision still relevant? What she's saying. I think I think that um, having a reference to that there will be future, um, and actually it might be that we do need to change the wording of that C slightly. That there will be future consultation on the um, future use of of Onikawa Park. I don't think we can refer to a splash pad space because we don't know if that's what we're doing. So I think it just needs to be point C, sorry, Carolyn, <laughs> um, that, the, um, that there will be a future consultation piece on the alternative use of Onakawa Park. And I would prefer that it was um, as simple as that. Sorry, Chris, can you see my- It's under G. Um, Councillor McGrath. Um, oh, sorry, my hand was up from an earlier stage. Oh, okay. Councillor Brown, are you the same? Uh, no. Um, oh, I just okay. <laughs> just trying to clarify exactly where um, where we're sitting on this. So there are limitations on what we can do with that land anyway. I understand because it's covered by the Reserves Act. So that sort of high level information you're thinking will include, um, and and things like we're committed to pulling the existing pool down. I, got, I suppose from a community perspective, what I don't want them to be worried about is that we're going to leave this decrepit old building in the middle of the suburb or that we're going to just pull it all down and leave um, a place for Tumbleweed to go through that we do, we are invest, we're comfortable that we are going to invest in that land. And so I think the consultation document needs to go into that level of detail, but not actually what we're going to do. Is that what you're thinking? That's right, yeah, without going into any um, great level of detail of what that might look like, because we simply haven't had that, that conversation as yet. So um, so it's just, yeah, that, that there will be future consultation on the alternative um, use of Onikawa Park. So, I don't I'll just... So sorry, Kirsten, we're just um, back down here, are we, where you've got the proposed yes. transformation of Onikawa yeah. Park. You want to change it in here? Yeah, just to say that there will be future consultation on the alternative use of Onikawa Park. Okay, okay. Um, the be future, future consultation on the proposed transformation of Onikawa Park. Um, Yep, and then remove the rest of that out, and then, but then they leave if an alternative site is chosen. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Kia ora, Mia Wise. I know that Councillor Brown's had her hand up for a while, um, but just on that matter, um, I will wordsmith, but I potentially would foreshadow to you, I'm not sure the word transformation is right. Um, I, was, I was thinking that myself. Yeah. <laughs> it might raise a whole heap of uh, different um, expectations, but of course, um, just noting uh, for the public as well that because of um, it's vested as a reserve, we would need to do a reserve management plan um, for the park afterwards. So thank you. 
so perhaps if we just changed um, transformation to future use or I'm happy for other people to chip in yep. with any suggestions. <laughs> yep, I've got on one. The, <laughs> on the proposed future use of only Kawa Park, yep. I was going to propose that we um, word it as we are committed to developing the land for community use and intend to master plan that with the community as a separate project. Again, and I, I want to keep it pretty simple. Um, Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Yeah, I was just trying to wordsmith, sorry, as well, your worship. This is a bit of a sticking point for me. Um, the consultation document needs to include um, inf inform pieces on the proposed investment in Onikawa Park to retain it as a free-to-use community space. Um, and that further consultation on that will occur. Again, I'm not comfortable with going into that level of detail at this stage as part of this consultation. I think that an indication that there will be consultation and that the, the park will be developed um, is adequate. And I don't believe we should be making any presumptions at, at this early stage around the details of that. What part of that, sorry, had detail disagreed with? Can can you read what you what you said again, please? The proposed investment in Onikawa Park to retain it as a free to use community space, and that further consultation on this plan will occur if an alternative site is chosen. No, again, sorry, I I think that that we actually that's a separate decision in itself um, as to whether it's going to be retained as a free community space. Um, I, I just think that we're actually mixing two separate things into one consultation. With respect, I think this may be a, a key point of difference because in my mind, I don't think you can separate what will happen to Onikawa Park from if the pool is removed from it and we need to give our community certainty and I'm prepared as part of this resolution to make a commitment to them that it would be a free to use community space and we will consult with them over the development of that. Can, can I just say parts of the park currently aren't free to use? Or would you be looking at changing that? So we can yeah. into the park. Well, we, we charge gymnastics to be there. We charge netball to be there. They're all part of the only car will park. It's not happy free to, to them. Happy to remove the words free to use and just retain community space. I'm happy to have retain community space. So, <laughs> Carolyn, yeah. you're doing a great job here. Thank you so uh, much. No, no, it's all right. <laughs> Uh, so where am I changing this in now? So, in, um, on the proposed future GC. use of the park um, as a community space. Okay, there'll be future consultation on the proposed future use in here. Um, so C would read, sorry, C would read the proposed investment in Onikawa Park. No, okay. no, no, right. sorry, no, that's not what I'm meaning. I'm meaning that to retain it, there will be future consultation on the proposed future use of Onikawa Park as a community space if an alternative site is chosen. As a community space, okay. Okay. Right. So 
So as um, councillors read through that, happy to take any questions at this point. And also, um, Councillor Bogue, if you can please consider that you're still happy um, as the seconder with the proposed amendments. Uh, yes, I am. Although I'm wondering if Deputy Mayor Crossman might like to think she contributed a large chunk of it um, as seconder. I'm happy for you, Max. Okay. Stick with it then, I'll stick with it. Um, as, as a suggestion, I don't know whether Kirsten, you would like to um, just adjourn from this item and go to another item while officers complete their wordsmithing and stuff or whether you want to complete the item, no? Um, I could actually just check in with councillors. This may even be an appropriate time just to have a 20 minute break and people may need to go and refuel and refresh themselves um, and then we'll re-adjourn. Is 20 minutes, is, is everyone happy with 20 minutes? So that would mean coming back at 10 past one. Okay. Thank you everyone.
Welcome back, everybody. I'm, I'm beginning to feel like this might have been the longest um, debate on one paper that we've ever had, certainly in the time that I've been on council. <laughs> so I hope everyone's feeling a little bit um, refreshed after that break. And we have been able to um, review the, the new amended resolution and just make sure that it um, covers off what we intended it to throughout the previous um, discussion. Um, so before we um, pop it up on the screen, I, I, in fact, no, we will just, um, do councillors want it on the screen or would you rather just be able to see each other while we move in to debate? Then, Because you've all got it in front of you on your own computers. So I think um, we'll just move into the final debate on what we now have in front of us. And um, again, I'll just make some very brief opening comments um, as the mover of the motion. So I would like to thank Annette for um, all the work that she has done on this. Um, I think it would be fair to say that Annette and I often have a different approach to things. She's very much a, a detail person and I'm, I'm probably more um, in, in, in that big picture sort of trying to achieve exactly the same result, but um, going about it in a, in a slightly different way. So I would like to reiterate that I believe that collectively as a group of councillors, we are all on the same page with this. And, um, and I'm, I'm confident that um, either resolution would have achieved that, but I'm completely um, accepting that some councillors were wanting some more detail in, in the resolution. So the priority for me um, with this consultation is to ensure that we are delivering on our promise we made um, to genuinely engage with our community on our future aquatic facility. For me, providing an opportunity um, to look at the design is a vital part of this process because I've had significant feedback from community members um, with concerns um, they have about the design. So it was very important that we had the two stage um, approach to create the space to enable that to happen. Um, we, as I said earlier, from my perspective, I, I didn't really see the need for such a prescriptive resolution. However, I was very happy to work together um, as we have done here to reach a compromise um, to enable us to move forward. And I do believe that the resolution before us now enables us to do that. Um, so I will open up to councillors to speak to the motion. Councillor Tapani. Anga Mihi, Your Worship, and to uh, our colleagues and staff for uh, working through those matters. It was great to have that conversation in an open space as well, given um, we were able to articulate where our focus was uh, as a council, even though it's not written down in specific terms within the motion. So um, I thought the long and lengthy debate provided good uh, information and exposed some of those key points to our public. Um, the only comment I have is I'll be speaking in favour of the motion on the table. Uh, I think this, we've been told several times by the experts uh, that this has been a very comprehensive and comprehensively analysed situation and options for our city and that many others have made a uh, decision to commit on much less information. Um, so uh, the confidence I want to send out to our community is that we have uh, probed uh, quite thoroughly every aspect of uh, the aquatic plan and this council is a reflection of its community. It was then, it is now. Uh, when we first had this put before us, uh, our community, community was as divided as our council was with a 5% difference between our community and a one vote difference between our council. Now, this next consultation will see our community armed with much more detail. And so the challenge now is for our community to give us a good indication and check that uh, we're still in tune with the same community we represent. And I think we are based on what I've seen and heard. And so I look forward to this consultation, consultation doc, document coming out. Ngami. Thank you, Councillor Tapani. Uh, Councillor Crystal and then Councillor Crown. 
I'll just keep it brief. Um, at the end of the day, um, what we're doing is consulting with our community, um, which is what we indicated we would do um, for them to decide where, uh, when, what a new aquatic facility may look like. Um, one of the things I would like to see um, moving forward is for council to investigate strategic partners to go into this project with us because otherwise it's a huge, huge ask for our ratepayers. So that's something that I would like to see moving forward. But I support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Crystal. Councillor Crown. Thank you, yeah, I'm speaking in support of the motion, the rework motion in front of us. Um, I wanna acknowledge the contributions of um, staff and the external experts and our community so far. Um, I think that the level of interrogation and due diligence that we've undertaken is what the community deserved, um, given the journey uh, that they've been on so far with this topic. Um, but I also, I wanna acknowledge the leadership that's been demonstrated today, notably um, by our Deputy Mayor and our Mayor. Um, I think it's a great example of how um, sort of two people or even 13 people with, um, with different lenses, et cetera, can come together, work constructively, practice compromise, um, but all from that starting position of making sure that the community is at the center of decision. So, yeah. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Your Worship. I just had a call on my phone at the same time, so I had to mute that. So um, I uh, will support the resolution as they are. And as I have earlier today um, quoted a number of people, I intend to quote another in finishing, and that was John Wise, who was a representative of the um, Onikawa, or, um, the Friends of Onikawa Aquatic Centre. He wrote a talking point on the 17th of August 2019 and in that he said the purpose of our court challenge is simply to seek new engagement and consultation on the decisions. I'm not going to go the whole thing. We believe our community was not presented with all the information and the process was seriously flawed. Well we found out that the process wasn't seriously flawed but now they are going to have all the information, transparency, and they will be able to make an informed decision. And as Councillor Tarpany says, I doubt that there will be a 5% difference between those for and against various options. So thank you. Councillor McGrath. Yeah, just through the, through the chair, Madam Mayor. Um, we have worked long and hard on this and it's been a very difficult topic for, for many, in, including the public. And a lot of us ran uh, our campaigns last time um, on a platform of better consultation. Um, I, I guess we're going to test that out in, in the very near future. And I'm hoping that the community, that, that, a, that a huge chunk of the community get behind um, making a decision one way or the other. Um, not, not, you know, in the past we've made decisions, major decisions based off 80 people um, submitting to us. That wasn't, that wasn't the pull. But let's get out there. Let's get the community involved. Let's get them to tell us exactly what they want. This is not a time to sit quietly. You know, if you're on social media, get it out there. Don't, don't tell social media. Don't tell Napier News. Tell the council. You know, when the consultation comes out, come directly to us fill in the form, tick the box to tell us what and why, but don't sit idle. This is a huge decision for Napier. So I support um, what, we've, what we've got on the table here and uh, I look forward to the outcome one way or the other. Thank you. Now, just quickly before we move to Councillor Price, um, Councillor Brown has just picked up a slight error in the resolution. So in the second part of the resolution around the capital review program, um, point B, it should say, note the interdependent relationship. Apparently it reads independent relationship. <laughs> so if we could just have that amended, please, Carolyn. Yep, just done it. 
Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Councillor Price. Consultation is all about relationships anyway, and uh, we're touching on it a bit there. Um, um, I'm just be very brief. It's uh, from my point of view is um, we've kept the promise that we said we were going to do after um, we had consulted properly three years ago. But um, I think we'll draw a line in the sand and move on. And um, I just like to think that people, um, us councillors, we, we do take the word of experts unless you can, uh, you can put a chink into them because that's what they are. I was, um, when I was in the police, I was an expert. And your opinion is, is right unless someone proves that it's not. And we've had some pretty high-powered uh, decisions given on this. Um, but apart from that, I'm, I'm really, I am talking in support. And, um, and I'm really pleased that we're going to uh, put part of this to bed before the next election. Thank you. Councillor Wright. I won't disappoint you all. I'm going to vote against the motion. I'm not voting against the motion um, as it stands, but in principle, there is one sticking point for me. All of the reports to date clearly confirm that Previson Drive is the best site for, to build a new facility for numerous reasons. And as leaders in our community who now have all of the information in front of us now that clearly shows this and shows that building the facility on any other site is going to cost an enormous amount of money that this community cannot afford, I would like to um, state that my position is that the council should signal that Previson Drive is its preferred site in the consultation. And that is why I won't support the motion as it stands. Councillor Brown. Yeah, just briefly, I'm uh, speaking in support of the motion as well. I think the sticking points for me around how that redesign worked has been uh, worked through really well. Um, and I think I'm really happy with the fact that we're going out with no preferred option personally. I think um, we could run into a tricky situation with the public if we came out saying the same thing, but with more information. So I'm really happy that we're going out um, with two, uh, with all of the information and just saying, public, tell us what you think. So thank you for the process. I really appreciated it. Okay, uh, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Thank you, Mayor Wise. Um, just really briefly to say, um, I'm supporting the resolution. I think it strikes a really good balance between making progress in supplying all of the unpolished information without any bias that we have to the community. Um, so I think we've come to a good position and it's, a, it's an opportunity for me to really share the huge amount um, of options that we have explored as a council um, and put that all in front of the community as well. So I'm looking forward to the informed consultation and I support the comments of Councillor McGrath around encouraging everyone to get out and have their say. Um, and I'm looking forward to us keeping that promise as well to consult on this, this term. Councillor Simpson. Yep. I'm uh, really happy to support the, um, the resolution. I think it's good progress that we're, we've had a good debate over it. I think we've reached clarity around what we want to achieve. And that is that we get out there and we consult and we start making wheels move to get a a better pool complex for our, our community. So thank you everybody, especially the governance team that have had to work tire tirelessly to keep up with us during the debate. Um, but no, I'm, I'm much more satisfied with the resolution that we now, now proceed with, hopefully. Thank you. Councillor Mawson. Yeah, thank you for the chair. Just echoing what uh, everyone else has said and in favour, I speak in favour and just Again, echoing um, thank you staff for your patience and also for our external contractors for their reports and so forth to provide the clarity that our community have asked us for and we've provided it. So yeah, echoing the other councillors as well, just sort of getting out there and saying, hey, get on with it and um, your, you know, your opinion matters to us. Thank you. So I don't see any more hands up at this point. So it, 
I won't do a right of reply because I think I think it's all been said and I think everyone will be just looking forward to me actually um, putting this to the vote. So um, you've all had a really good look at um, the set of resolutions. So I would now ask that all those in favour, please say aye or raise your hand. And against. So... Just okay. Councillor Wright against, is that correct? Thank Makes you. Okay. Councillor right. Bogue's got her hand up. Oh. All good? Yeah. Right, PO. So, moving right along, agenda item number two the adoption of the speed limit bylaw ah. review 2022. Um, and do we have uh, Tony or Keegan um, present to do a very brief introduction? It's pretty self-explanatory. You've got, you've got me, I'm afraid, Your Worship. Oh, Robin, welcome. Um, <laughs> good afternoon. Thank you for uh, um, getting here. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, hopefully this will be a little less vexing than that last item. Um, uh, just before I run into the um, introduction, which is all it will be, obviously, um, just to note that page five of the actual bylaw itself is missing from the agenda. Um, Carolyn's just had the full version sent again, just, just so that can be shared with um, members. Um, so that basically means that schedules eight and 10, which are the 100k roads and the um, variable speed limit roads uh, are missing from the document in front of you at the moment. So, um, our apologies for that. Um, so we're just here just to confirm following the hearing um, last year. Um, this is only um, a, a very minor review of the, the bylaw um, following the initial process that we went through um, last year and the year before. Um, to, to include um, four sections of road that were requested by, by submitters at that stage. Um, so um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that, that members have um, in relation to those. Thanks, Robin. I'll just open up for any questions from councillors. Mm -hmm. Your Worship, just, just, um, I'd like to just put forward a motion, um, recommendation, basically uh, an amendment to the officer's recommendation. Just noting the, the change to Willowbank Ev speed and removing that. So, what, what, what exactly are you wanting to change? Sorry, Councillor Morstan. Just, just, the, just the, the remove, um, just an amendment to the officer's recommendation. Just noting a change to Willowbank Ev speed. Just removing that 100k to 80k speed. Removing it from the table. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand what. Oh, sorry. It, basically, noting it, no change to Willowbank Avenue speed is what I'm saying. Um, but so it adding, has been. Adding, no, no. So leaving it at 100k, not 80, is what I'm. Oh, proposing that we actually. Yes. Re sorry, yes. Re re okay. Um, do is there uh, is there a seconder to the amendment being proposed by Councillor Mawson? Um, just a point of clarification, Madam Mayor. Would this mean that the whole um, we'd have to go back out for consultation on that particular item? Please, if somebody could inform me. I don't believe we would need to, but if council officers are of a different opinion. Uh, through your worship, uh, I don't believe you would have to go through full um, consultation again. Sorry, through you, your worship. However, to be clear, um, council officers, based on uh, the uh, based on the um, consultation, are recommending uh, it stay as eighty. Yes. Yeah. Or sorry, be moved to eighty. Okay. So I'm not seeing. Uh, oh, Deputy Mayor Brosnan, you've got your hand up. I was just going to say, Your Worship, I'm happy to second Councillor Mawson's recommendation to allow him to speak and reserve mine. Good as gold. 
Okay, so we do have um, an amendment before us that Willow Bank will remain at 100k. And as the mover of the amended um, motion, I invite Councillor Mawson to speak to it. Thank you, Worship. Yes, I fundamentally disagree. Uh, a lot of the roads that were um, have already been debated went through on one of the main things as being consistency. Um, I mean, this is especially, and I, I disagree with that. Um, I don't disagree over time, as Councillor McGrath said in the committee meeting or the hearings at the time, I don't disagree that over time with development in Te Awa, that it may be prudent to change the speed. And it is my understanding as per previously stated by staff that um, a review can happen at any time. So the reason my point is consistency is suggests that a driver can't make the right call to travel at the right speed, completely ignoring a sign that clearly shows them what speed to travel. In fact, if consistency was one of the arguments, I'd actually put it to people that um, if the speeds stay they are, the way they are, then change is probably the hardest thing for drivers to, to overcome. Um, since we've had our previous meetings, a lot has changed. Um, in, in the national aspect, we are deciding on one road here, but I mean, I'd like to, to point out to Council that recently a change has been made on a road that affects NAPI users, and that is State Highway 5 for NAPI Topo Road. And an overwhelming majority of, from all over and outside Hawke's Bay, including people in Hawke's Bay and transport companies and so forth, 90% of them said don't do it. And even some of us have individually voiced our opinions against that. And certainly we've endorsed the Red Horse Bay Regional, Count, uh, Horse Bay Regional Transport Committee in challenging Wanka Kotahi on the speed reduction. So what's my point out of all that? If Waka Kotahi were to use the line of consistency with State Highway 5, that would be completely unacceptable to our public. Now, I'm not saying safety is not important, it's very important. Losing life is tragic, and I'm not arguing with that. And I'd like to acknowledge those that have lost loved ones on roads. However, not looking at a holistic approach with when, when starting to look at speed limits is basically shutting down a conversation similar to that, saying, do lives not matter? Well, that's, that's just, it's, it's a lazy answer to a conversation that needs to be had. So on that note, in the subject of safety, I would argue those in the communities of Te Arato and Te Pahui who have greater reason of concern, being that straight at their front door is 100 k's an hour, was, and they actually didn't want to have that change implemented for them. Certainly with Willowbank Avenue, everything is straight and clear and for what it's worth, there may very well be an accident there, but everything was there for people to make their own choice and whether or not they stepped out onto the road or whether or not they chose to leave an intersection. With respect to staff, they have done a very good job and it's been very thorough. And that goes to show with some of the, um, the previous roads I've actually agreed with. And they're just working through the guidelines that are suggested to them and data by Waka Kotahi. And I'm sure they've got their own opinions as well. Waka Kotahi de deemed our semi-rural roads to be in the top 10% of dangerous roads in New Zealand. My rough calculations is that it's approx approximately 83,000 kilometers of roads. Napier has 357 of those roads and they're not all semi-rural either. That equates to 0.43% of New Zealand's roads. And according to Waka Kotahi's own data, all of our semi-rural roads are 10% of New Zealand's dangerous roads. It doesn't stick up. I did go into asking uh, Linda Stewart, the Waka Kotei Regional Relationship Director, about what that means. I won't go into this now because it's been a long day. But essentially, the way I see it is it only ticks one of three boxes Willow Bank have for that, the, those issues. Ultimately, I'd like to invite Council this opportunity here today to send a message by making a stand against Waka Kotahi politically. And we would not be putting anyone in our community at greater risk as they were yesterday. In conclusion, this is one of our last opportunities to keep a realistic speed and a nice straight road in our city. 
consistency is not a valid reason. That is, and now is not the right time to change the speed at Willow Bank Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mawson. Uh, did you wish to reserve your right to speak, Councillor Brosnan, or speak now? Uh, I'll reserve, Your Worship. Okay, then Councillor Bogue. You're on mute, Councillor. You're on mute, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, it was such a good speech. <laughs> um, thank you, Councillor Mawson. I appreciate um, your passion about this particular issue. Um, but I look at it from a different viewpoint. I'm looking for, at this speed reduction as a cyclist and as a former school teacher. Now, if you recall, when we had our hearings, I think in September, one of the very first presentations we had was from a gentleman who lived off, Riverbend, off Willow Park Road, who made quite a, um, an impressive PowerPoint presentation to us um, about the importance of us reducing the speed there from 100 to 80. And it was discovered then that this had been an oversight in the number of particular uh, roads which we the officers had ask us to look at reducing from 100 to 80 and we did follow all their recommendations because they were based on safety. The Automobile Association agreed to all our speed reductions and um, there was another family who made a presentation about how they were very nervous about they didn't want their children to ride their bikes to Terradale because of the speed on that particular road. What happens, particularly I'm thinking of um, the new cycle pathway along the cross-country drain, which crosses over Willow Bank, um, it's very hard to tell when you are crossing that road, if you're standing watching it, how far away the traffic is because it's moving so fast. So I accept that, um, you know, this is a, is a busy road. It's a growing number of residents building on it and um, particularly for cyclists and for people with families in that area keeping it at 100 I think is far too fast and I look forward to to um, it being reduced to a safer speed thank you thank you Councillor Bogue uh, do any other councillors wish to speak to this Councillor McGrath Yes, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, as much as I'd like to support this, um, look, I'm, I'm a car guy. I love to get to the speed limit. I'm not going to say I go over it. I like to get to the speed limit and drive uh, safely uh, within it. But at the end of the, the end of this road is a school um, with, I think, about 1,200 students, and some come from Taradale, uh, and, and some will end up coming through Tiawa as well. Um, so basically on, on those grounds alone, I can't, I can't support it being 100 k's and uh, I support it dropping down to 80 as, as has been recommended. So that's me. Thank you. Councillor Tarpani. Ngam uh, Mihi, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Mawson. I was um, took the time to ponder your points and consider them against the journey we've taken around the speed law, speeding uh, bylaw review. And um, I find myself in a position to support the recommendation of the officers as it stands. Uh, we're only 107 square kilometres. Um, and I appreciate that it is a straight piece of road. And I note with interest that people do try and hit a target when they're journeying along that road um, and also I've noticed that it can be fraught with challenges when you have vehicles moving at 100 kilometers per hour, road users such as cyclists um, popping out of um, areas that are obscured by some of the natural elements along that road as well as the fact that half of it is has an open drain along the side of it which leaves other road users that are not a car 
uh, with no real escape plan if they are using that road. We are, as a council, um, spent quite a bit of time building strategic statements, meeting with our uh, constituencies around promoting more active forms of uh, transportation, which brings me right back to 107 square kilometers. If a city of our size can't continue to grow in that space, um, then um, we are going, as a nation, have serious problems. So I'll, I can't support the amended mo motion uh, as it's presented, and I will be supporting um, the position of the staff in the interest of the safety of our community as it continues to grow around development in that area. We've had a 50% increase month after month on uh, resource consent. So activity everywhere across the region is increasing. Um, and for me, that means a change in behavior when using our roads in order to provide safety. So I'm happy to support the officer's recommendation. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh... I don't see any further hands up. Uh, Deputy Mayor Brofnam. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Just very briefly, I'd like to congratulate Grego on your very well reasoned um, and thought provoking resolution. Um, I am reading the room and will personally be voting with, with some of the other councillors that we've heard from um, speak on this topic today, but I just wanted to um, encourage you to continue bringing to the debate um, your very worthy views, and I congratulate you on doing that on this topic. Thank you. And um, Councillor Mawson, just your right of reply. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all my colleagues. And certainly uh, there is zero argument towards safety. Um, I will just say that with Willowbank Ave that uh, yeah, there has um, obviously been some mitigation put in down the Napier Boys High side that clearly does an amazing job. So thank you staff for that as well. Um, and yeah, that's that's it really. Safety is, is certainly very, very important. Um, and I think my point has been made. Thank you. Thank you. And I did just want to check in with governance as our seconder has essentially indicated that she will be voting against the amended motion. Um, therefore, we no longer have anything to vote on. Can you just confirm that I'm correct in that? If um, Deputy Mayor Brosnan is going to withdraw from seconding is probably the best option. Deputy Mayor Brosnan, are you happy to do that? Yes, happy to do that, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Uh, but thank you for creating the space for Councillor Mawson to be able to share his views with us. Much appreciated. Okay, so we'll return to the original officer's recommendation, um, which is in front of all of you, and the recommended um, change in the new speed limits. Um, I will put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Sorry. Um, you haven't got a mover and a second oh, to no. the new one? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm happy to move back from the chair. Do we have a seconder? I'll, move, I'll second it. Oh, Councillor Bogue, thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't wish to say anything further. Councillor Bogue, do you wish to say anything further? Um, just to thank the officers, as others have, for um, these recommendations, which I know are based on safety and I think everybody will be pleased, particularly about the school limits being reduced um, because they are the most vulnerable of our road users. So I support um, this adoption of the speed limit bylaw review 2022. Thank you, Councillor Bogue. So uh, I will just open up in case anyone else did want to speak to this any further. So I'll put the motion, all those in favour, please raise your hand. And against? Just me against. Councillor Mawson, thank you. Yep. In principle, the safety aspects, yeah, happy with it. Just, uh, yeah, just the, the speeds, thank you. And moving on to agenda item three, which is the summary update on Civil Defence Emergency Management Group. I'm just scrolling down to find it on my computer. If you just... That would be for me to speak to Mia Wise if you haven't got it in front of you. Perfect, thank you. Um, kia ora and thank you through the Mayor. Um, in the interests of time today, I will take the report as being read. It is a routine report um, so that you are able to see uh, the discussions of the Civil Defence and Emergency Management Joint Committee. 
I'll take the report as read and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Steph. Um, open up for any questions. No, therefore, can I please have a mover and seconder? Thank I'm you. Happy to move. And, and seconded by Councillor Simpson. Did either Excuse of you wish me. To... Sorry, who moved it? Councillor Price. Oh, Councillor Price, thank you. Yeah. Uh, did either of you wish to speak to that? Just a routine report, provide some information. Okay. Uh, if no one wishes to speak to it, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye or raise your hand. Against. Carried. And next up, we have a new report that will be coming to us um, each council meeting going forward. It's the Chief Executive's report. Um, and I'm sure everyone will agree that this is full of um, all sorts of incredibly useful information and updates. And it's fantastic to be able to share this with our community in this forum. So I would invite the Chief Executive to speak to this, please. Um, kia ora, and again, through the Mayor, thank you, councillors, for the opportunity to present my first Chief Executive uh, report. Um, it is filled with metrics, and the intention really is not only to be able to discuss any of those metrics, but really is to provide trends over time as well. So I will um, say that I will seek any feedback on the report informally or, or formally, uh, but the view is to produce this every uh, six weeks. Um, so uh, thoughts on metrics that would be useful um, would be greatly received. So just to summarise a couple of quick points, again acknowledging it has been a long committee meeting. So it is important to raise uh, the issue of COVID and business continuity. So as at today, we have 24 staff members who are COVID positive and obviously isolating. Uh, and we do have another 18 additional staff members who are impacted as being household contacts and are also isolating. We are doing our best uh, to ensure that that doesn't impact business continuity and so far we have managed uh, to do that. So a key point for us to watch is how those numbers grow, um, as everyone will be aware. I will make the statement that it's not just our staff and some of our contractors are also starting to be hit hard by vacancies as this Omicron wave really uh, starts to impact Hawke's Bay. So we're in constant discussions about what that might mean from service delivery point of view. I think it's also worthwhile to again draw your attention to the um, portfolio of reform. Mayor Wise has already um, talked through the 47 recommendations in terms of the governance representation and accountability group. I think it's important to say that as officers we are still digesting those 47 recommendations and seeing um, what our next set of questions or steps may be, of course not knowing whether or not the government will accept them. And then also for any members of the public listening, um, Napier City Council had the opportunity to do a workshop with the Future for Local Government Reform um, working group uh, to put forward a number of views and answer a number of their questions. <laughs> In addition to uh, the various reform portfolios, I did want to take a brief moment to acknowledge some of uh, the work that is going on here in Napier. Uh, and in particular, I'll ask governance to play a very short video about the issue of um, our bores and a project that is of high interest to the public. Thank you, Mayor Wise. Clean, clear water is incredibly important to the Napier community. The A3 bore where we are now is part of a program of works that we're undertaking to ensure that's delivered. Navy City Council are working with Honour Drilling to construct and test this new bore at Awatoto. Since the end of October, we've been installing the new A3 water bore. We're now down at 120 metres. We've set the screens down at depth, and we're now developing that up to get the good, clean water from that aquifer back up to the surface. At the bottom of the bore, we have a screen set of 11 and a half metres long, which is what we use to allow the water to come through, but to trap the stones and the silts and the sand so that we don't find that coming up through the bore. When we're drilling and installing the casing for the bore, we go through a lot of different, what's called lithology, different layers of sand and clay and stone and gravel. 
And ultimately what we're looking for is that nice strong gravel layer down at 120 metres, which is where this aquifer has been identified. So when we get down to the 120 metres and we've set the screens, we're exposing ourselves to the artesian flow that is down there. That is high pressure water that is trying to find its way to the sea that we are getting up through the bore here at Awatoto. That pressure is sufficient for it to come up in what we call free flow. So without the aid of pumps, we are getting a flow of water that is coming up through the bore. In terms of the water quality, it's clean, it's clear, and we've had it tested to show very low levels of iron. Capital works, operational works, and maintenance works are all really important and come together to deliver clean, clear water. So for the next steps, we have two major flow tests to run. One is a step test to understand what the bore can actually handle, and then we have a seven day flow test during that period, we'll be monitoring the bores around the local area to make sure that we're not affecting them in any adverse way. And then we'll be in a position to hand this over to Napier City Council. Once the team have finished here, a containerised treatment plant will be brought in and then the team will move to Taradale to drill the T8 bore. Thank you for allowing that, Mayor Wise. Um, we are really pleased with the progress on the A3 bore. Um, the only other point I'd like to draw councillors' attention to in my report is the um, economic development metrics and in particular some of the impacts that our community is seeing. So uh, for your um, benefit, we are monitoring this constantly. Um, and last week, um, average uh, footfall traffic across Hawke's Bay was down 33% based on this time last year. So there has been reasonable um, impacts on our community as the report shows. With that, um, Mia Wise, I'll hand back to you, Your Worship, and take any questions. Thank you, and um, thank you for sharing that video. I think I speak on behalf of all of us when I say that we're very excited about these new bores being completed and coming online and um, being able to go out to our community and uh, dirty water issues, a thing of the past, all going to plan. So um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So I will open up to councillors for any questions that they may have of our Chief Executive. Councillor Bogue. Uh, yes, thank you Chief Executive. I'm not sure whether you're the right person to ask this question because it's not in your report, but I have been asked by some members of the public about signage for the new Māori names which were part of the Mana Ahuriri settlement which took effect last week. Are they just wondering, or perhaps you could tell me where I could find out this information, where, when the signage will be available so people can <clears throat> see where those names are and what they are. Thank you. Um, kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Bogue. So some signage replacement has already taken place. Um, it is logical to replace these signs as they need to. So, for example, um, we have signage at what was formerly known as Stroms Gully, uh, which is updated the next scheduled piece of work is Mataruaho signage, um, but perhaps it would be more useful if we prepared the schedule for you as councillors and brought it back through our committee so that um, that could be seen in its entirety. Um, Deb Stewart, do you have anything further to add or Morihu in terms of timing or should we um, perhaps just come back to council with paper? I'm going to take their silence as I've Can got some. Got thumbs up. Thank you. So um, thank you, Councillor Bogue. We'll come back with the full schedule. Okay, I can't see any more hands up at this stage. So uh, I'll ask for a mover and seconder, please. Thank you, Councillor Crystal. And can't see anybody else's hand. Um, um, hand I'll up. second. Councillor Moore. Councillor Tarpany. Oh, yeah. Oh, Councillor Tarpany, yep, excellent. Would you like to talk to that, Councillor Crystal? I just, um, thank you, Steph, for this. Um, it was, I found it really interesting and full of a lot of very useful information for us and um, a lot of, you know, especially going through all the different bills and different things that we are dealing with Council. Um, so it's, you know, it's an awesome report to now receive. Councillor Tarpany? Uh, only to say, um, 
really looking forward and uh, grateful to see that this is going to become a regular aspect of um, our reporting. It's a great report and it lifts again our profile amongst our community to keep them well informed around where we're going and what we're doing. Ka pai. <laughs> Any further councillors wish to speak to this? I'll put the motion to note the Chief Executive's report. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Against. Carried. Next up, um, another very important paper, our annual plan 2022-23 um, development supporting information and consultation approach. And is, is aware, Caroline or Adele who's talking to the paper? But, but just before we do um, have, have this presented to us, I did want to just take an opportunity to, um, to say to Caroline, who I believe is the responsible officer, that I found this report incredibly easy to follow. It was very well written. Um, and I think for any community members who um, have decided that, that they want to have a look at it as well, it really clearly articulates um, where we've landed in terms of what we're going out in our draft annual plan. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that and say thank you. And I'll pass across for the presentation. Um, thank you, Kirsten. And um, through the Mayor, in regards to this um, paper today, um, yes, there is a team that sits behind and supporting our corporate planning for council. Um, and the team includes Jay and Lawrence. I also want to thank them for the efforts in pulling the paper together as well. So thank you. Um, the purpose, as you've indicated um, through the Mayor, is that this gives us the opportunity to review um, what we have in our long-term plan and then to adjust for any um, not significant matters through the annual plan process. Um, as noted, any requirements that do require significant changes need to be addressed through the long-term plan amendment process. So today it was actually um, providing um, information to the community and for Council to adopt so that we can go ahead and prepare the consultation document for the annual plan. And so we're noting what those changes are in this paper and um, through the processes that we've had with Council today, we've achieved that through a number of workshops. And so we're noting under the resolutions that the matters that we're going to be consulting with the community on are around the Napier Aquatic Centre, and that was endorsed by the earlier um, discussion that you've had with Council today. Um, it's around the coastal hazards assets that will be transferred as part to the Regional Council. And there's some initial um, discussion happening with the community at the moment. We will um, advise the community around our rates increase. Um, and this is actually slightly lower than what we had in our long-term plan as a cap of 10.4%. Um, and we're proposing a 9.8%. I'll talk to what those um, material changes are to achieve that 9.8%. Um, we're looking to also um, propose the use of um, reserve funding for our tourism activities. Um, unfortunately, the impacts of COVID are being seen across the NACU community and to the best of our knowledge, we're providing a forecast to council, which shows an impact of potentially 1.5 million, depending on how long this will last. And we're proposing the use of reserves that weren't used um, which we have previously consulted with the community on. And just noting that we will be undertaking some further work with the community around housing. So the options um, for council that you've effectively agreed today is that um, you'll be providing um, $4 million for 22-23 um, to be provided for in the annual plan. Um, that the agreeing to um, transfer the coastal asset, um, assets transfer to the regional council and it will be um, consulted separately. Um, the, and also we'd like you to note, we're actually requiring you today to adopt the fees and charges for 22-23 because this informs the revenue that we will receive from our activities based on our assumptions and that schedule um, will be then available from 1 July. Um, I'll just talk to um, the report, we were noting the reasons for our rates increases for 22-23. Um, so as everyone will be aware, we are facing quite high inflation at the moment. Um, to the end of December, it was 5.9%. Um, we have provided for inflation of 3.6 into our budgets. We have provided for some operational contingency um, in line with it as well around the labour markets and construction markets, which are seeing higher than um, those inflationary adjustments. We have some costs that we've been progressively bringing in with regards to our wheelie bins, and this is equivalent to 0.9%. Uh, 
Um, we're requiring some increased funding to operate our three waters activities. The cost of insurance has also seen a rise for us, which we need to um, be able to ensure that we've got um, a suitable level of insurance cover for our assets. And then we've got um, new activity and priority projects of the council, including a new city ambassador program, digitising our property files, contributing to the regional economic entity, and um, also the Art Deco Trust grant. Um, the rest of the paper um, talks a wee bit more about um, the consultation matters and, and where we um, see that sitting within our consultation profile. Um, and then we're also looking at the changes to our capital plan. Um, I've got John Kingsford online today and I will ask John to talk to the um, changes that we'd like to um, progress in terms of effectively the timing changes um, for those projects on the capital today. Uh, kia ora tato. thank you for that Adele. Um, can you hear me all okay? I'm operating off a different headset today. Yep, nods, thank you. Uh, so yes, we are proposing some changes to the capital program for 22-23 uh, financial year. Um, that has uh, been a, a pretty involved process largely related to our carryover process that we undertook at the end of um, last calendar year. Um, it was a, a very much an iterative process looking to balance uh, ambition of program with capacity across our organisation to deliver that program. Um, throughout this process, we've provided some context on progress on the 2021 program of work to our activity and asset managers uh, to review that progress in line with uh, priorities and ability to um, uh, make substantive gains on, on projects both within that year and how um, progress may or may not relate to subsequent uh, annual plan years. So the um, in a number of cases the, the changes that you see um, relate to uh, a need to reprogram project funding, uh, forecasting out um, in some instances into a single year, um, being this calendar year, or sorry, this financial year, or across multiple years, uh, including 22, 23, and, and further out. So um, just looking at some of those changes, um, they are perhaps some of the more notable changes have been identified in the report. Um, and I'll just touch base on the record table on that. Um, sorry, I'm report. Just bear with me. Sorry. So if we move to it's uh, the page title summary of changes between uh, year two LTP. Uh, and 2022-23 annual plan, uh, you'll see the relative changes at an activity group level uh, with perhaps the most significant changes around community visitor experiences, which has a number of activities within that, um, some change to property assets and uh, notably changes at the wastewater and water supply activities. So those are identified for any uh, changes over um, $500,000 in the following table. Uh, city strategy, some changes there relating to parking technology. Uh, that's a program of work that is underway now. Um, water supply, uh, there's a number of items in there. Uh, the most notable being the carryover of uh, close to 4.6 million for the uh, Mataruho Reservoir program of work. Um, wastewater, a uh, significant amount of carryover there relating to the Pandora Industrial Main brought into the 22-23 year from 21-22. Um, and I do uh, understand that that has now gone to tender, uh, which is a great milestone. Uh, so those are perhaps uh, of the, the most significant. I'm just noting in Stormwater there, there is $4 million uh, identified for Tiawa land purchase 
um, that has been carried over and just noting that that is entirely dependent on uh, third party um, development within that area. Um, so added, and those are the carryovers added to um, the 22-23 is an additional 4 million um, for the aquatic center, which is obviously the subject of the reports today. Uh, 500 brought into, uh, 500,000, sorry, uh, brought into 22-23 to enable progressing the Tehinga detail design. Um, 1.06 for the library rebuild, brought into 22-23 from 21-22. So these are some of the carryovers that uh, we refer to. Uh, 1.8 million for the introduced storage property purchase according to 22.23 from that same year. Um, so without uh, perhaps reading through every other line item, uh, we perhaps either throw back to you or Dale or take any questions on those items. Um, thank you, John. Um, so yes, um, I will probably hand it back to the Mayor. Um, the, the resolutions um, are probably quite clear. We're just needing Council to agree um, to um, the items for consultation um, as set out and to agree um, the proposed rates increase in other resolutions so that um, staff and of Council officers can go ahead to prepare the consultation document for adoption at the end of March. And then we'll be going up for consultation thereafter, ready to adopt by the end of June um, for an explanatory year. Thank you, Mia. Great, thank you, Adele and John. And you said as a rather extensive list um, of officers, officers' recommendations, um, which you all have in front of you. So I will just open up for any questions that councillors have. Councillor McGrath. Yeah, just on page uh, 135, with regards to animal control, I see there's $100,000 in this year's budget and $103,000 in next year's budget. Um, can anyone tell me what that is for, please? Me through you, um, Madam Mayor, Councillor McGrath, can you say the page number again? Um, um, mine's Capital Programme. Yeah, so, so I, I can um, probably speak to that, Steph. So as we noted, um, our budgets have been adjusted for inflation. So effectively, that is our uh, inflationary adjustment um, as things keep moving. Has that answered your question, Councillor McGrath? No, because it, it's it's under new impounding facility. There's a hundred thousand in this year's budget, hundred and three next year, and no real big money till two twenty five, two twenty six. So I was just wondering what the two hundred thousand was for specifically. Through you, Madam Mayor, John Kingsford here. Um, perhaps I could respond to that one. Uh, that was uh, some money set aside to undertake a business case for potential new impoundment facilities for the, the, um, the animal control facility uh, down there at Depot. Um, so not anticipating that that is a, a given, but looking into uh, what might be required um, what the level of service requirement is, what the regulatory requirements are, and what that might mean in terms of um, the, the provision of impoundment facilities at the current location. Uh, and yes, you, sorry, I'll, just to, to finish off that point, uh, yes, that was some money that um, perhaps was a few years ahead of any potential construction monies, um, recognising that um, we uh, needed to smooth program and that the, the construction of a, a new impoundment facility uh, might come a little bit later. Um, equally, um, you know, that also provides a, a wee bit of wiggle room in terms of having that business case completed. Thank you. Councillor Crystal. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question's on the um, fees and charges portion. Um, there's actually an error in there where the municipal theatre charges um, quote the war memorial charges and the municipal theatre charges are missing, just to tell you. 
And the second one then goes to the War Memorial, um, of which I'm quite perturbed about. The increases to all the community rates are way more than any increases to the corporate rates. And then the increases for wedding are double. Um, in fact, it's cheaper to hire it as a corporate rate in the evening than it is to have a wedding there. Um, they also want to charge the same for a wedding in the small exhibition hall as the ballroom. So can someone please tell me the rationale behind all those quite um, dramatic increases? Can I just, Antoinette, uh, are you online to be able to um, assist in the response for Councillor Crystal? Sorry, you, for you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillor Crystal, I'll probably have to have a look at those and get back to you. Uh, we had a look, had a careful look at all our fees and charges, and um, they've all been adjusted to achieve the increased revenue targets that we were looking at this year. So um, I will have to um, come back to you on that, but I can follow that up um, offline and, and provide a response to all councillors. Well, just, I guess, um, it's just a reminder that this is a community facility. It's what it was built for. And, um, you know, the um, to go from $776 to $1,300 for a wedding is quite a significant difference. So, yeah, I look forward to your feedback. Yeah, I'm sure um, the differential has been taken into consideration um, along with our competitors as well. But I will come back to you. So just a question of clarification from me, um, from a, a governance perspective, because we're being asked to adopt the fees and charges schedule today. And if we've got outstanding questions about it, then we're not able to do that. So we would just remove that part of the resolution. Um, I, oh, sorry, I'll let, no, you go Adele. Um, Kirsten, the choices would be to adopt as they are, and then we can make any amendments in future, because otherwise um, we're unable to progress the consultation document, um, because we won't have anything confirmed. Um, the alternative is, um, as you've mentioned, to take it off the table, but it may delay our ability to complete the consultation document for annual plan and um, the underlying revenue impacts, etc. Um, so if we adopt today, when would be the opportunity for us to make any amendments to it? Um, we, we could bring it back to any future council meeting. They, they but, will, but, but they're obviously only going to be insignificant compared to the total fees and charges yeah. um, as a whole. That's correct. Okay. But it would mean that the schedule in its current form would be what's included in the consultation? That's um, Yes, but we, we, we can bring that back as well um, for the 31st of March meeting, and that will be um, forming part of the final documentation for consultation. Okay, thank you. And just while we're on the topic of the War Memorial, could I also request that um, the name is changed on the schedule, because it's actually being referred to as the Napier Conference and Events, which is the business unit, not the venue. So could we amend the name, please, to be the War Memorial, um, Napier War Memorial Centre? And I would like that to happen before it goes into the consultation document. <laughs> it's a relatively straightforward change. <laughs> okay, um, any further questions? Ah, Councillor McGrath. Got a couple here. Um, I just note that the sound shell usage has gone from a fee to um, now being no charge and the liquor licensing fee is unchanged. Is, is that correct as I read it? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, I believe the sound shell um, going to zero was agreed previously. Uh, can I just test that, Adele? Uh, when we made some amendments to the charges following the long term of plan, I'll just double check that, um, Councillor McGrath, while we're talking. Um, but yeah. I believe that was decided previously. And can I just ask again your second question? Uh, the liquor licensing fee, I think it is, is unchanged. I'm just wondering what the rationale behind that is when everything else seems to have gone up. I've Thank just you. Yep. 
I was just wondering if it was related to um, the difficulty that some of those sites had had through COVID and we were being nice, if that was the case, whether we'd consider doing the same for the eyesight displays and street uh, table and chairs, which have gone up both, both industries that have probably been the hardest hit throughout COVID. And it would be nice to show a little bit of support to these people by not putting all their charges up. Thank you. Um, and this, I'll just check if the other Richard M is online to answer the liquor license one. Um, but, but through you, Madam Mayor, I'm suggesting that we've probably got three questions in terms of the detail of the fees and charges that we need to just quickly find some answers on. So the other option that is available to you is to move on to another agenda item once we have all of those questions. Um, Councillor McGrath, the the liquor license uh, question, I just need to test the answer, but I can um, I already dis dis okay. yeah, discount that it's not being nice. Um, over to you. Um, thank you, Director Strategy. Uh, yes, through the chair. Sorry, I'm struggling here with the technology. Beg your pardon. If I'm not, oh, you can, I am on, the, on camera. Right. Um, look, I'm afraid I'm not able to um, answer the rationale behind that too, so I'll have to dive off and see what that exactly was, to be fair. Um, so yeah, I think that what the, um, the CE is suggesting in terms of coming back to that while well, we get a bit of clarification around that, which is, as I understand it, um, Councillor McGrath is basically the rationale behind keeping the liquor licensing fee as it, as it is. So I'll, we'll, we'll get that and then um, revisit this. Is that correct? Thank you, um, Richard Monica. So through you, Madam Mayor, we'll just continue to see if there's any further detailed questions on the fees and charges, um, and then officers will aim to get those answers before the end of this meeting. Thank you. Jeez, Madam Mayor, you are on mute. Um, so yes, if we could just focus for the moment on any questions relating to the fees and charges schedule um, to enable council officers to go and investigate those and then um, we will um, move on to the, the next paper and come back to this before the end of the meeting. So Councillor Bow. Uh, yes, with the sound shell, um, Councillor McGrath, there is no charge and there's ever been any charge for just using the actual stage but I think there's a typo, and I did point it out previously. <laughs> for the, the this is on page um, 188. Um, it says hourly charge, blah blah blah, no charge. And I think those ones are meant to be no change rather than no charge. The no charge one is the use of the stage, and the rest of them, from what I gather. What seems to me to be rather than going from 25.90 to nothing is meant to be no change so that fee stays the same. Is that correct Adele? Um, through the Mayor, yes we're just getting confirmation on those matters at the moment. Not nearly as exciting. <laughs> okay thank you. So um, we will just park this paper for now and move on to uh, next agenda item, which the, is the order of candidates' names on voting documents. Um, the paper is relatively self-explanatory, but I would just invite the reporting officer, um, Helen Barbier, to, to talk briefly um, to it. Kia ora koutou, thank you, Wise. And yes, it is a, a fairly um, straightforward report. This is the beginning of our preparations for elections in October this year. Um, what I'm requesting is that we maintain the standing for um, Napier City Council um, candidate brochures that the names are fully random. So what that means is in one household, three different individuals um, would get potentially three different versions of the voting papers as far as the order of the candidates' names go. And the reason um, we're recommending this is that it tends to um, mitigate any bias that, that might occur um, intentionally or unintentionally around the candidates whose names come first and last in an alphabetical order. So happy to take any questions. Thank you, Helen. Uh, just open up to councillors for any questions. One, one simple question through you, Your Worship. Yes. Um, can, uh, Helen, could you confirm for me that the randomization algorithm that's used to spread those 
um, ensures that there's an equal weighting of people appearing at the top so that we don't get my name appearing at the top all the time. That'd be such a shame. Um, <laughs> could you confirm for me the algorithm allows some degree of confidence there, please? Absolutely, yes. It's, it's a, a, a system that's used um, nationally and it does ensure completely random selection from paper to paper. Thank you. Any further questions? Could I have a mover and seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Taylor and Councillor Price. Did either of you wish to speak to that? Sorry, Hayley and Annette. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all. Oh, and Kirsten, you're at the other end. <laughs> um, okay, I will put the, put the motion then. All those in favour, please raise your hand. And against, carried. Agenda item number seven, amendments to the 2022 Council Committee meeting schedule. Um, I, I don't believe we need to invite the Council Officer to speak to this. This is purely um, procedural. Just noting... Um, so excuse oh, me, you want... through, through you, Mayor Wise, if I, if I might, I just following the decision this morning that perhaps a, including the consultation around the pool, that we might need to change the order of some consultation through the year. I just wanted to check with the CE, Steph, did you want to change anything or remove anything before we go ahead and move something that we need to amend next time around? Um, kia ora, and thank you through you, Madam Mayor. I think it is okay to take this paper um, and uh, as read and to work on this paper, but the points that Ms. Barbie is making is that once we've had the opportunity to, to work through that consultation document, we will likely need some further changes. So just for, just noting that for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I will ask for a mover in seconder, thank you. Councillor McGrath, seconded by Councillor Mawson, uh, any comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. And against, carried. Next up, we have the Three Waters Reform Transition Unit. Um, and I'd just invite uh, Adele Henderson to speak to the paper, please. Um, kia ora, through you, Madam Mayor. I might speak to this um, as Adele's just chasing up on those fees and schedules, um, although I'm sure she's brilliant at multitasking. Um, Councillors, the paper before you today uh, is a paper that I requested, which is um, a recognition of the multiple different moving parts of the three waters reform. So we'll take the paper as read. However, what I'm seeking from you today is an acknowledgement that there is still a very strong role that councillors are playing in terms of um, uh, opposing the reforms in their current structures uh, and that is a strong advocacy role which needs to be supported but at the same time myself as chief executive I'm getting a number of requests from the national transition unit uh, to, con to proceed with um, information that needs to be provided for them to do their work. So speaking to some other officers around the country um, that we have suggested that we bring a paper to you where essentially we are asking for your endorsement that I continue uh, to engage with and take the necessary steps with the National Transition Unit um, and that these processes run in parallel until such time as we have clarity over uh, the three water reforms. So I'm happy to take any questions on that. Thank you, Mia. Um, thank you, Steve. Just a question from myself and um, I think that this paper is useful in terms of providing that clarity around where um, council as elected members um, are standing in the space as opposed to, you know, what you need to be able to do as the chief executive. Uh, but just wanting to ensure that we will still be having visibility of the requests that come through to you and potentially some input into those um, if we would like to. Absolutely. So there's multiple ways um, that that can happen, either through sustainable NAPIO or at sometimes through audit and risk committees. So there will still be full uh, transparency, um, mere wise. Uh, just, um, I suppose, 
putting in writing uh, and acknowledging that I do need to uh, be involved in the National Transition Unit and their work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions from councillors? Uh, could I have a mover and seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Simpson, seconded by Councillor Tapney. Uh, did you wish to speak to that, either of you? Only to say, Your Worship, um, it would be uh, also useful to include in the uh, information uh, a reference to the public accessible documents and their website to help um, our residents keep a track of conversations from an independent source. Kia ora. Thank you. Councillor yeah, Simpson. My only comment through Madam Mayor is I think it's wholly appropriate that uh, our Chief Executive engages. I think it's one of the best ways for our organisation to remain informed despite our opposition to the proposal. Thank you. Any uh, further councillors who wish to speak to this? Right, I will put the motion uh, on. Uh, uh. Uh, oh, Councillor <laughs> Yep. <laughs> um, I'm speaking against the motion. Um, this paper shows to me quite clearly that the government has no intention of withdrawing the Three Waters proposal. So I do support the part of the recommendation delegating the CE to undertake steps to ensure we are reform ready. However, I think that continued blanket opposition to the reforms is going to leave us in a very weak position when they go through. As the Mayor said at the beginning of the meeting, the independent working group um, who's been looking at our objections to the reform presented their report yesterday and I was um, I attended the Zoom meeting of 200 plus <coughs> councillors, mayors and um, other people who heard about them. So they didn't make any mention about our Hawke's Bay proposal or any such alternatives, but they did come up with what I believe is a compromise recommendations covering some of the most contentious issues public ownership of our assets, risk of privatisation and the lack of local voice. So we have not as a council yet had a look at these recommendations. So saying we'll just continue to oppose the reform, even if the recommendations, even if these recommendations haven't been considered, I believe is premature. I know that there are 29 other local authorities who have joined us in a blanket opposition to the three water reforms. Whether they will keep that opinion or not, it's too early to say, but I am aware that not 100% of our constituents are opposed to these reforms. So my minority view is speaking for them. So I do not support the recommendation as it reads. Thank you, Councillor Bogan. Just one um, point of order. I, I don't think it is fair to say that we are, uh, have blanket opposition. Um, I think as a council, we have acknowledged that there is a need for reforms and what we are advocating on behalf of our community for is around the, um, the process, the inadequate process and um, the fact that we still have a number of questions and every council in the country sent in questions which we still haven't had responses to um, so just wanting to make you know that that point of clarification there um, now if no one else wishes to speak to this did I ask for a mover and seconder no <laughs> can I have a mover and seconder please um, sorry yes you did sorry. have a mover and a seconder it was Councillor Simpson and Taylor ah Oh, Tapani. Oh, Tapani. Sorry. Yes. Thank you for that. Okay. I will. Um, I will therefore put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. And against. So that would just be Maxine, I think, who is a against. Carried. Um, now I am going to suggest we do have another five minute break um, that will give council officers a little bit more time if they haven't quite um, got those answers for us as yet and I'm sure everybody would appreciate getting up and stretching their legs for a little while. Um, so it is 2.46, um, so yeah, if we could all be back in five minutes to uh, get underway again, please.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we aren't quite ready to return to the annual plan paper as yet. However, we will move on with um, the rest of our open agenda, which uh, now is the reports and recommendations from the standing committees. As per usual, I will work through these um, collectively, but if there is a paper that any councillor wishes to speak to separately, please let me know and we will do so. So first up we have reports from Napier People and Places Committee held on the 3rd of February 2022 and the number one first agenda item was the Napier Civil Defence Siren Network Removal. For you Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, I'd just like to seek that we add a time frame for resolution B which is seeking the, the Sedum Group um, to provide information back from the proposed education program. We left it somewhat open, um, but the, there was a fair bit of public chatter around the removal of the sirens and some concern around how the new national system worked. I thought it had been well communicated but, uh, nationally when there had been some events, um, but apparently there is still some concern amongst our residents. So I was wondering, if we could seek from officers, um, if, if um, perhaps internet's still available, so how quickly they might be able to come back to us to either the next council round, or they would have missed the agenda for the people and places, or whether it would need to be the, the council round after that. Yeah. Um, for you, Madam Mayor, I think we could probably achieve that fairly soon. Um, I know there's been significant work done in that public um, education space um, with the with the campaign, um, and I think the Sedum Group would probably be ready to present to the council um, at the next available committee meeting. So we could put a time frame, um, you know, around the, the next meeting schedule. I'm pretty sure we could probably pin them down for the next People and Places Committee. Um, to present by way of public forum, um, but unless they're not available that day, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to actually um, lock that day in until we talk to them. Yeah, through you, Madam Mayor, that would be appreciated. I think the key concerns for residents are if they don't have smartphones or if, if they are responsible for people with disabilities or know of people with disabilities and may not be able to directly engage with the national warning system, I think they're wanting some form of assurances as to how, how they should act in those cases. Yeah, and, and through, the, through you, Madam Mayor, um, you probably will have seen that the um, public education campaign um, has commenced in terms of the tsunami siren um, sorry, the tsunami signage um, on our beaches um, and there's um, additional um, programs in Hikoi planned, um, which you might have seen some media around. So we'll get um, that presentation to council locked in um, within the next meeting cycle. Um, I see, Steph, you've got your hand up. Did you just want to add something to that? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I will, but perhaps if we go to Councillor Mawson and then I can just wrap up with some final comments before you close out. Okay. Councillor Mawson. Yeah, just in a reply to uh, Councillor Simpson, I'd just like to point out that with the, the uh, siren system, there are some members in our community that didn't get that, and that was the deaf community. So the shift, whilst it seems like some people will be disadvantaged, there are certainly some that already are disadvantaged by the current system that will actually be able to get something for them. And I feel the deaf community is probably one of the community that really needs to be looked after. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so actually, Councillor Simpson, just wanting some clarity from you. Are you are you happy that we've had a verbal commitment today around some timing, or did you actually want to amend the recommendation to include a time frame in there? Uh, no, I'm now satisfied um, that officers have that in hand and that they're prepared to come back um, now with a confirmation as opposed to that there was nothing previously. So I'm, I'm more than happy now. Thank you. Thank you. Steph. Uh, thank you. So uh, just for clarity, I would like to point out, use this opportunity to point out that the sirens have not been working for many years. So while we are talking about um, decommissioning them formally in this paper, um, I think it's important for those members of the community uh, listening to know that um, due to technology and due to the sirens themselves, um, what Napier City Council is doing is actually 
formally decommissioning them, but they have not been um, operational up to this point for some years for a number of reasons. I agree that we can come back with all of that information um, and I appreciate that we're not going to put it in the resolution to allow a little bit of flexibility with dates um, for Antoinette and I to work to. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, so um, I will move on because we don't need to vote on this separately with there not being any changes made. Uh, now I am aware um, that Councillor Bogue had um, a suggested amendment to the strategic housing review. So um, Councillor Bogue, I will just pass across to you to um, provide some information on that. Thank you. Um, I just felt, Madam Mayor and Councillors, that this is a very important uh, proposal that we're sending out for consultation. I just wanted to make sure that we'd covered <clears throat> everything that, um, for example, that was sent out to us this week. So my suggested um, change was fairly minor, but I have sent it to, um, to governance and it's basically it's that instead of the Make Your People and Places Committee, if you have a look at the recommendation, it's that Council and A and B remain the same, but with C, I've made it into a more formal statement which says that Council approve the statement of proposal, Council housing provision, colon, semicolon, the high level consultation plan and the submission form on the future of Council housing provision. <clears throat> And I've asked that these, it says somewhere that these will be available at say at Napier or in paper form from the NCC Customer Service Centre, Napier Library or Taradale Library. So I did send it to through to governance this morning, if it's possible for that to go up, please. That should so be up now. It is up, thank you very much. Okay. It's just in order to cover all our bases and make a formal approval of those documents that are going out for this quite extensive um, consultation. <clears throat> so I will move that if there's a seconder. Do we have a seconder for that? You may need to... Um... I will second it. Oh, Was that you, uh, Councillor Wright? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, and um, may I so speak this, to it, please? Sorry. Yep, yep. Um, what I was just going to do prior to, to moving into that, um, Councillor Bogue, was just uh, we have had some amendments come through since the original um, paper was debated uh, at the People and Places. So just wanting to check in if anyone had any questions with regards to um, probably specifically the statement of proposal um, or any of the other supporting documents before we move into um, the debating the, the item. Doesn't look like it. So the floor is yours, Councillor Bogue. Cool. Um, I just want to say, you know, this represents a very, quite a long journey that we've made, which started in 2018 with a review of our housing assets and um, has continued through reviews and reports until we reach the stage of being required to put three options in front of the public. It's been a very hard time for our tenants, like any tenants who whose landlord is thinking about selling their property. It's been a time of great um, insecurity and stress for them. But unfortunately, we don't have a silver bullet to solve the dilemma um, and keep ensuring delivery of housing to our over 400 plus tenants. So across New Zealand councils, um, pension housing have filled a niche for pensioners who couldn't afford market rentals and weren't on the social housing register, or if they were, they weren't up high enough. So the issue is not whether or not there's a need for subsidized housing for this cohort, but how to make this provision sustainable. And council has thought long and hard and looked at all the options. And um, we have in this, in this proposal, we have put certain covenants around the suggestion of um, offering the possibility of sale, and that is that our tenants have continued tenancy, that whoever buys it keeps continues to provide um, subsidized housing for pensioners and disabled 
tenants and that we as a council would have the right of first refusal if they were to sell it. So now it's up to the community to come back to us. We're particularly interested in how not just the wider community, but also our pensioners as well, um, think about the options that are put in front of them. <clears throat> and I would like to um, show my gratitude to uh, Natasha Mackey, who's done a huge amount of work over the years to get this uh, proposal together and to help us through the different um, hoops we've had to jump to get where we are now. So thank you, Natasha, for doing their due diligence and helping us to make sure we've put the best possible options in front of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bogue, for that very useful uh, summary of where we have come from uh, to arrive at this point and heading out to the consultation. So, Councillor Wright, did you have anything you wish to add? Um, thank you, Mia Wise. Only just to again reiterate that my thanks to the staff for the massive amount of work they've done on this and um, and you to you say to the public, please um, give us your feedback um, so that we can make a, a well-informed decision on this and hopefully a sustainable one moving forward for our community. Thank you. Do any other councillors wish to speak? No, I will put uh, the motion on this one with that amendment uh, around those supporting documents. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Against. Carried. Uh, so the last paper in uh, this standing committee was community grants and funding overview. Uh, if there's no further discussion on that, I will put both Agenda item one and agenda item three, I'll ask for a mover and seconder for the two of those, please. Thank you, Councillor Crystal, seconded by Councillor Wright. Did I see your hand up? Um, excellent, any any comments? Anyone wish to speak today, please? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Against, carried. So I believe we have um, the information ready from council officers now for us to be able to return to the annual plan um, paper. So I will um, ask, I'm, I'm assuming Adele is going to be reporting back to us on those questions. Um, through the Mayor, it was, it's going to be a team effort. So I'm going to invite Caroline um, to talk to the majority of the questions um, that were raised. Um, Anthony will be able to talk to um, question that um, Councillor Crystal uh, asked and we've got Richard Marker on available to talk to the statute requirements of his charges. Oh. So I'll hand over to Caroline first. Thank you. Thanks Adele. So um, there was a formatting error where the war memorial fees and charges were pointing to the municipal theatre fees and charges. Um, so we apologise for that and we will make that correction in the um, final version of the fees and charges schedule. The name change um, we will correct, so we'll make sure that the, um, the War Memorial is correctly um, stated up for where it should be in all of those fees and charges. The um, sound shell, um, Councillor Bog is correct, there is no charge for the use of the stage, and, and where it said no charge for the rest of the rows, it should have been no change. So there should be the same dollar figure in that column as the previous year. And we'll make that change for those rows. And then liquor licensing fees are set by the regulation under the sale and supply of the Alcohol Act. So um, they are set, we cannot change those. And I'll hand over to internet for um, the information on the hireage charge. Yes, um, thank you, Caroline. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, just on the Napier conferences and events at the War Memorial Centre, um, charges for weddings haven't changed um, over the last couple of years, and we're not proposing to change them for the next year. The schedule that we currently use for fees and charges um, at the War Memorial 
um, has not been translated very well into the council schedule of fees and charges. The $1,300 um, is the charge for weddings and that is for the ballroom, um, the small exhibition theatre and the gallery and that's for um, afternoon and evenings inclusive. We don't actually separate those out. So um, yeah, that there is an error there in the way that it has actually been translated. So the $1,300 is, the, is a flat rate that we have used for the last couple of years. It hasn't increased and we're not proposing to increase it next year as well. And I'm pleased that Caroline picked up on the, um, the Napier Municipal Theatre charges as they seem to have captured a lot of the war memorial charges too. Great, thank you. So is that covered off? That's covered off everything? Uh, through you, um, Madam Mayor, um, is just the sale of liquor. Um, so in terms of that, we have no discretion to uh, alter the fees. Uh, they're set by statute under the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act, and that hasn't changed since 2013. So there you go. Wow, interesting. About time they reviewed them, wouldn't you think? <laughs> um, okay, I see we have a question from Councillor Tapani. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, Your Worship, nice simple question. Could we have um, those changes and amendments circulated uh, after you've um, made the necessary reflections, please? Thank you, Councillor Tapani. Um, Adele. Thank you, and just through the Mayor, so I just want to confirm what the process will be today. Um, so if we have um, Council note the changes that have been discussed, that we will then confirm for a final report to come to Council for the 31st of March um, that can be adopted. So, um, so effectively today we're asking you to agree in principle because the underlying information is what needs to be approved so that um, officers can continue to develop the annual plan. But we will bring and the final document back to you for the 31st of March in conjunction with the consultation document. We're just noting um, the minor amendments that need to happen, but otherwise, in principle, everything else was fine. Thank you. Thanks, Adele. And I wonder if, just for the sake of um, correct process, we do just make a slight amendment to the officer's recommendation that we adopt the fees and charges schedule for 2022-23, subject to um, the amendments identified today. Thank you, Mia. Thank you. So I will um, just check that there are no more questions because we sort of did get a little bit sidetracked by the fees and um, charges schedule and there's a lot of other components of, of this paper and the annual plan um, consultation. So do um, councillors have any other questions they would like to put to council officers? No, okay, so um, I will move this paper from the chair. Could I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Um, so I, I, will, I will keep this brief, but I do just want to acknowledge um, the significant amount of work that has gone into this um, from council officers and um, from elected members um, over the course of five workshops uh, we managed to bring the proposed rates increase down signif significantly from over 20% um, to the 9.8%, which as mentioned is below uh, what our cap had been in the long-term plan. Um, it would be fair to say we've had a challenging couple of years and I think that it will continue to be challenging uh, certainly through this year and into the future. So we have attempted to pull together a draft annual plan that um, ensures that we are as agile as possible to respond to changes while still remaining in line with the outcomes our community wants from our work. Uh, so very much looking forward to feedback from, um, from the community on this. And as we have said earlier in this meeting with regards to other consultations, strongly encourage um, community members to, to make a submission and, you know, 
it is going to be buz a busy time. So acknowledging um, that it, it can be difficult at times to find the space and the time to, to submit to us, um, but would very much like to hear from you. Um, so Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Thank you, Your Worship. I won't um, make too many further comments to your own, just to highlight in there that there's quite an important um, consultation item around um, or informing the community around that transfer of our coastal hazards. And I know that there's been a huge amount of work um, in the Joint Coastal um, Committee with the other councils to get to a point where we're all at that same stage to consult on this. Um, and yeah, echo, echo your thoughts around it's been a really tough year and we're, we're doing our best um, to kind of cut that cloth as I think you mentioned earlier and looking forward to all the community feedback on, on ways that we can, we can meet the needs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, invite any other councillors who wish to speak to this? Uh, there being none, I will put uh, the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Against. Harry. All right, so we'll move on to the next um, report from the Prosperous Napier Committee held on the 3rd of February 2022. Agenda item one, the Taradale Bridge Club sponsorship signage was a decision of the council. Item two was the investment and debt report, and three, report on Three Waters Reform Program. There's no further debate on those. Could I have a mover and seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Taylor and Councillor Crown. Uh, did you wish to speak to those? So I will put those. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Against. Carried. Next up, we have the reports from Sustainable Nature Committee held on the 10th of February. First up is the petition for a pedestrian crossing island on Latham Street. Next is the lease of Reserve Omni Gymnastics Centre. Three is report on Napier water supply status for the end of quarter two. And four was the capital program delivery. Thank you, Councillor Price, for moving that, and Greg, uh, Councillor Mawson, seconding. Uh, if there's no desire to speak to it, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Against. Carried. The reports from the Future Nature Committee on the 10th of February, one report being the Resource Consent Activity Update, uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Brosnan, seconded by Councillor Tarpany. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Against, carried. Uh, now, I did just want to check in with governance um, with regards to the Extraordinary Sustainable Nature Committee. As we have had a report supersede these two reports, which we debated earlier today, are we still required um, to vote on these original papers? No, uh, because... No. Um, and in the minutes, um, it'll be reflected that they've been already been addressed previously. Um, yeah. So yeah. No, we'll just you. leave those ones. Yep. Thank you. I thought that would be the case. I just wanted to double check. Yeah. No, that's fine. Uh, and uh, excuse there... me. Sorry, Mayor Wise. Can I just test that? Were the reports, um, just my question is to Carolyn, were the reports superseded or was the new report supplementary? Um, it was additional information that had been requested at the um, um, extraordinary meeting, and because there was so much of it, it was um, it, it changed all the recommendations. So um, oh. that's why it's sort of superseded and it's overwritten um, the ones that were made at the sustainable. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Mia Wise. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next and last up, we have the reports from Nā Manuka Nuka o Te Iwi. Um, just noting that uh, we had to finish early uh, due to our, our member needing to leave, so we weren't actually able to work through um, the Nature People and Places Committee reports at this particular meeting. Um, but we did have a separate report around the NCC Trade Waste and Wastewater Drainage Bylaw Renewal um, presented to the committee and um, 
if there's no specific questions on this, I will just ask for a mover and a seconder on that, please. Thank you, Councillor Price and Councillor Bogue. So all those in favour, please raise your hand. Against, carried. And the final report uh, for our open agenda today is tenders let. Uh, are there any questions from councillors on any of the information in this report? No, so I'll ask for a mover and seconder, please. Thank you, Councillor Wright and Councillor Tarpany. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Against, carried. So I um, declare the open portion of our meeting today closed uh, and excuse me um,